Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 244 of The Team House. I'm Jack Murphy here with Dave Park. This is a special Saturday edition of the show. We usually go on Fridays, but Dave and I were had our little adventure out in Montana. Uh, we're back now with our guest on the show tonight is John Dovey. Really excited to have him here. A very unique experience, kind of unlike pretty much anything else we've had on the show, any other guest we've had on the show. John served in the both the South African Defense Force and then the South African, uh, it's a national defense force, SANDIF. So John had this experience going through the transition in 1994, before and after, and he served in the infantry, mechanized infantry, and the engineers uh, deployed to the Congo and, and some other places. Um, again, some really unique experiences. And John, we're really happy to have you here tonight to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really, I feel privileged to be on here, especially on this uh, 11th of November, Armistice Day or Remembrance Day. So Veterans Day here and happy birthday, Marine Corps, yesterday. So, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and and John, that's why you're wearing the poppy today. Yeah. Well, uh, no, I'm glad that we could do this. And, um, you know, I will start off the, you know, the way we start off most of these interviews. I'd like to ask you a little bit about, you know, what your upbringing in South Africa was like and how that sort of brought you towards military service. Okay. Um, my parents were divorced when I was very young. Um, and I, I kind of understand why. My father was basically conservative in a lot of ways um in the idea that he, that he wasn't really interested in politics he um just voted to go along and and that wasn't an, an interest in his life my mother on the other hand was i think in today's terms we would, we would call her progressive she was very liberal especially for the times and the place um and um so i had that um dichotomy but between the two and, and the experience of the two um so <sighs> When it got to the military, I I fell under the the, the, the our version of 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 conscription of um of, of the draft, so I had to go anyway. But um, I had wanted to be a soldier almost on my whole life, and um, when we had to, all of us had to register at sixteen while we were still at school, and on the on the form there was a place to volunteer for or to state our preferences, and every time that I do it, I do it twice. Um, I volunteered for special forces because I thought that that was the the ultimate thing to do. Um, uh, yeah. So then, when I finished school, um, I went off uh, to do my what we called national service, mm -hmm. which was um, yeah, which was um, what 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 you would maybe call the draft. It, what what year was this? And I, I was going to ask you about what you know there, that there was a draft with the border war going on and everything around that time frame. Yeah, so um, um, I finished, I did my, my last year of high school in, in 84. And um, so the 10th of January, 1985, um, at 10 past, at, um, 10, past um, um, 10 in the morning, um, I got off the, the, the troop train that had taken me from Durban, more from Maritzburg um, up to Pretoria. I got off the troop train and um, with long, along with hundreds and hundreds of, of, of others as a civilian. And about two hours later, I had been inspected, detected, uh, injected, um, issued with all kinds of kits. And I was, I, I was yeah, well, exactly. And I was, <laughs> my head cut and everything. And I was running around, um, go and fetch me that leaf from the tree and, and, you know, that kind of stuff, uh, by a variety of, um, of, um, people with, with all kinds of stripes on their arms. So, um, there was a, a rude awakening. Um, <laughs> yeah, there were, 900 and some change of us who arrived at um what was it's actually that was interesting it was the 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 medical college in in pretoria in, in Futrik, with the sort of army base there that had volunteered or been selected for special forces and we spent basically a week a week and a half there doing pre-selection we did all kinds of tests and we had to pass like a 15 kilometer route march in a certain time and with a certain weight and we had to do you know all the pt tests and then they did a whole lot of psychosomatic tests and a whole lot of um, machines we had to kick and see how hard, what our potential was, all these kind of funny things we didn't understand. And then they selected about 90 of us out of that 900. Uh, and the 90 of us, they put on the back of trucks and drove us through the night, a couple hundred kilometers to to Bloemfontein, where we, we were um, introduced to 
um, one SSB, one special service battalion, which is actually armor. So this little group of um, of potential SF, but sort of infantry leaning people, we, we did our basic training in an armor unit amongst the armor. So we would wear green berets and they would wear black. So it was quite clear who was who. Um, and when we got there, we were met by a guy. Um, his nickname is Doiby. He was then a captain. He had come down from 3-2 Battalion. Um, there was, um, if anyone knows anything about 3-2 Battalion, they were based at, um, on the border um, within, with Angola. And he came down, and he was also going to go through through, through selection uh, for Special Forces. And then he took us as a, um, a specialist instructor, basically, um, through basic training. So we did normal basic training, which was, you know, up at 5 in the morning through until, like, seven at night and then but an hour or two before five and an hour or two after seven he had us and he'd um we do things like pole pt and walking with heavy bergens on our backs and preparing us us for selection mentally and physically um what's interesting about about him about what we could see is he made it through selection became he became an operator and he ended up spending just on 20 years as chief of staff of the special forces brigade until they kicked him up to general officer rank and then eventually, eventually retired uh, <laughs> a, year, a year or three back. <laughs> Incredible. And, and so you're there going through basic training at that time, nineteen mid 1980s, uh, mm. getting ready for special forces selection. And what was sort of the, um, the like military climate at the time? Because, you know, especially for our American audience that doesn't maybe understand the, what the border war was going on at that time. Okay. Um, that's that's kind of difficult because there are there were a number of sort of streams of um, mm. people and thoughts and and various things. So, um, just yeah. So English Afrikaans people don't I'd, I'd say Africa, don't quite understand how sep how much separate tribes almost they are. Yeah, we were matched together, and um, it was for a lot of us the first time interacting even socially. You know, across language groups. I mean, at school. Uh, we would have like uh, some of our worst enemies in terms of playing rugby was, you know, the local Afrikaans school and the local sort of English <laughs> school. And, you know, oh, yeah. they were first thrown on the rugby field and before beforehand and afterhand. And so, you know, there's that continual rivalry and stuff. Um, so we were thrown together into the mix. And then on top of that, um, the governor just passed a law that said any expats, and there'd been a whole lot of expats that they brought in as specialists to do various sort of uh, um, specialist jobs they needed. And they'd been there for some years and they, they said, well, your children or your, your male sons, if they want to remain in the country and maintain their residency, they have to go and do national service. So they became subject to the draft. So that was one of the first years we had a bunch of uh, foreigners that were thrown into the mix as well. And the way the army worked is that the official policy was that it's 50-50 English Afrikaans. So there were lots of jokes about it. And the easiest one is that uh, one of our, our drill instructors, the corporal, the, the, the corporal said was, he says, all the numbers are in English and all the words are in Afrikaans. That's bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, that was interesting. Um, especially there was one guy who was actually Belgian. And the corporal didn't understand that a large part of Belgian speaks Flemish, which is 80% the, identical to Afrikaans. This guy, this big guy, he was like, I don't know, six foot four or something and quite fat. From the first day of basic training, he said, uh, I don't, and he spoke French. I don't understand you. I don't understand, and you refused to understand English, Afrikaans, anything. You only spoke French, and they tried to teach him to march, and he'd camel march, and they would freak out and do what drill instructors do: shock attack, smoking, whatever you call it, and he just like, huh, and keep on doing it: camel march, camel march. Eventually, they sort of gave up, and he was a squad on his own. They would sort of stumble along behind the rest of us wherever we did, I mean, wherever we went, whatever we did. At the end of almost four months of basic training, we do a final passing out parade. We all do the thing. We come off, we finish the parade, and this dude has been standing under a tree in the side of the parade ground because he couldn't be part of the parade. He can't march. Comes marching up, slams his foot in to come to attention in front of the, of the corporal, and in fluent Afrikaans, greets him and says, thank you for the time I've spent with you. Does a perfect about turn <laughs> and marches off brilliantly off the field. And everyone was just completely 
blown away. That he had the guts and the the know, internal fortitude to be able to pull off a con like that. Yeah. Yeah, it's impossible. It was yeah. With all respect to him, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. Um, so just you know, um, so uh, there's all kinds of, of of like of things I can say. I can't answer your question directly, but um, let me give you this other anecdote. So there were a lot of people who wanted to get out of the draft or wanted to 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 not not to not do their their service. So they'd do funny things like drink a can of condensed milk, thinking that then their urine test is going to test positive for high sugar. Therefore, they have diabetes. Therefore, they must not you know um, they must be based closer to home or mustn't mustn't do do their service. Those kind of things. There were all these scams that people try to pull to get out of service. And this one guy knew that if you were homosexual and you arrived there, they'd send you home. You know, you'd be you'd go classified as G3 and you went home. You arrived completely in drag with high heel shoes, a wig, a dress, his legs shaved with work. <laughs> what they did to him, enter the platoon, do your basic training. And every morning where they're inspecting for, for face being shaved with a piece of cotton wool, the freaking corporal checked his legs to see if they were shaved. <laughs> This is in the middle of the most for Trump, the most conservative that you know government and the most conservative organization, and that's if that's who you are, that's who you are. But then you meet your own standard. And he, he was straight. He, this was a con, and they forced him to keep up the con all the way through basic training. <laughs> Those silky smooth legs all the way through basic. Training. And they would inspect every day when they inspected everybody else. They would check his legs. So you know. Um, Weird stuff. You know what the army's like. It's um, um, from the outside. The movie sort of look as everyone sort of falls in line and does all their thing, um, but there's like currents within it, and they they are individuals, the people that are mavericks that get away with stuff that you don't believe it, and you know all of these kind of things. But behind all of that was most definitely the concept that um, the omana, meaning the old men, the the guys who were a year ahead of us that they were coming back from the war. And mm -hmm. we saw that and we would see them, we'd go to church parades, um, we'd meet them on pass, we'd, you know, we'd see them, whatever. And there was a respect that you had to pay and that you did pay that these guys are your immediate seniors and they'd seen something that you hadn't seen and that you're training for what they're experiencing. So there was definitely a constant undercurrent of this is as much bullshit as it is, basic training, it's for a purpose and for a reason. We 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 we're training for war, mm -hmm. um, and it was and it was serious. I mean, it was fun in some ways, like this, like I've, I've said, but it was generally generally and genuinely serious, um, which um, yeah, it's a good thing, I suppose. And the the sort of like, uh, and I don't know even how aware of it you were as a young man, just going through basic training. But, uh, you know, the South, South Africa security threats at the time, they were looking at what Mozambique, Namibia, and Angola primarily. Correct. Well, well, I mean, um, you know, it's very difficult to remember what I knew then and what I've uh, sure. learned since then. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, you kind of you kind of um, um, make make memory past that is actually memory now. So it's quite difficult. But. But what we were told was was two things, Swat Gefar and Roy Gefar. So black danger and red danger. Mm. And um, um, and that was a consistent sort of thread coming out of the the political sort of circumstance and what have you. And and we saw that to be true. I mean, we'd watched, I mean, my 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 uncle um, um, was a underground mine manager in northern Rhodesia, which was became Zambia. Um, but his wife Maureen was um, she was born in, and raised in in um, I mean, in Kenya and as a young girl she experienced the Mau Mau attacks and the the barbarism of that. So we've been watching through not through political um, stuff but through lived experience, watching our families, watching some of our families coming out of out of Rhodesia and in in the, in the, um, at the transition in, um, in 1980. And we'd seen all the all the stuff that they'd been doing. So for us it was a lived experience that there was in fact, a terrorist threat, a um, revolutionary threat, whatever you want to call it. Um, not because of what we were being told, that reinforced what we, we were having as a lived experience. So I went into the army in 85 with having had family come out of Rhodesia with literally only allowed the cars that they drove and the clothes they had in their backs, leaving behind everything that they had, their houses, their clothes, their 
they furnished everything they were not allowed to take any of that out. I, w- I had an aunt, a Maureen, who would tell stories about um, the Mau Maus and how as a young girl of like seven, eight, nine years old, she would literally load um, rifles for her mother to hold off people who were attacking the house. So we grew up with, with that and was direct lived experience from family members and stuff. So for, so for a politician to say there is a danger from communists and um, from these black revolutionary forces and what have you was like, a okay, yes, no, we know. You know, there was no surprise. Mm-hmm. People tend now, looking back on it, to try and tell us that, oh, you were programmed and you were, um, um, you know, it was propaganda and whatever. And we're like, no, 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 no. No one had to tell us. We were seeing this from from our loved ones and from our families and from, you know, their, their lived experience. So, uh, so, yes, there was that kind of thing. And then, but then there's another side to it, and that was, um, <clears throat> Like most men of, of 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 that kind of age, we were interested in just a very few things, <laughs> and, not, and none of them actually wore a uniform. <laughs> right, and, um, that was just the way it was. And um, um, so, the army was something you had to endure. Um, everyone had to go. Um, uh, you know, um, it was what you had to do. And um, politically, it doesn't matter. You had to decide: do I go to go to go to prison for six years, or do you go to go to the army for two? And that was the um, that was the quite stark choice you had to make, and um, and, and a lot of guys made that choice. I mean, in conscription campaign, what have you? They said that they had an ethical issue with with serving in the army, and so they ob- objected, and they got locked up in prison for six years. So that was that was clearly the the, the, the choice you made: is go through this, make the best of it you can, to get out of it what you can, or go to prison. And, you know, you wanted to go all the way. So, I mean, could you tell us a little bit about going to SF selection, what that was like? And I, I take it, what what were you talking, could you go to selection straight off the bat like that to the Reckies or was there another sort of progression? No, no, no. So, so at the time, um, I think that we were like the, the first year or the second year that they'd experimented with the, the concept of taking national servicemen directly into, into the process, into the pipeline. So, um, we were told and we experienced that, that, that their planning wasn't terribly uh, up to par. That's why we had to go to the medical base and not to uh, the, you know, not the special forces base because they didn't have enough space and et etc. Cetera, et cetera. So um, we were an experiment because what happened is that, um, unlike I think you guys generally ac- across the board, um, there were a number of years where the SF, uh, the South African um, um, SF, um, held all the normal selection and nobody qualified, and they were quite happy with that. Mm-hmm. That's not the case in most other places. Yeah. Um, in most other places, there's a kind of a percentage, you kind of, and people look at the percentage and why did only this amount and not that amount? And for our, for for our guys, it was very much like, well, there was no one good enough, which is a completely different sort of situation. And but at the same time, they knew that they needed more people. And so they wanted to throw more people into the mix and hopefully find a better way of, of getting more people that actually qualify. So, I mean, we went from over 900 to 90. At the end of basics, there were only 30 of us. We went down to 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 um, the bluff, to one Ricky on the bluff, and then eventually up to Duku Duku for selection, um, about 30 odd. and. When they happened, there were about 250 odd people from the other places in the Army, Navy, Air Force, whatever, who'd come through. They'd already been serving or whatever. So they also joined for force for selection. And out of those, call it 300 people, six made it. So from, I don't know what their percentage is, but it's like over a thousand people down to six making it. And of the six, oh, four actually only qualify. And that was wow. a good year. That was a good year. I think the entire border were 25 years. I am subject to correction. There are only like two or 300 guys who actually got the operator's badge. Um, so that was, it was, you know, um, people asked me, well, why do you even say anything about doing it? You failed. And I was like, yeah, I did. But I tried. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, got, I got to a certain point and I discovered things about myself, about my ability to, um, to overcome my physical limitations because it's in your head. I went through that whole process. I pushed my body to its limits. Um, and then beyond them, because my, my mind could overcome that, um, I learned a bunch of things along uh, along the process. And I'm always proud of the fact that I that I did get as far as that. Um, do I regret not making it? Well, no, because um, I try to live my life without regrets. Um, I try to see everything as a learning opportunity. I don't always get it right, and you sometimes got to you know talk to yourself a bit. But but yeah, and I think my life would have been quite different if I had made it. Um, 
I have a lot of friends who who, who spend time in that in, in that community, and a lot of them um, done very well for themselves, but it, a significant number didn't. So yeah. that significant number didn't didn't make it through. Um, but it sounds know, like, uh, despite you know not making it, you had this growing experience, and that there must have been yeah. something in you that really loved the the army and loved that life. Okay, so the real reason I didn't make it is they had a selection board beforehand and then they had a selection board at the end mm. and the selection board at the end, cause I tried a second time as well. Anyway, the selection board at the end told me, um, you're not suited because we operate in small teams and the way that you operate, you require more of a traditional type military that gets uh, recognition for what you do, et cetera. And you're not the not psychologically suited because there's no doubt I was fit enough. I was fit as hell. Um, um, I was, I had the endurance and I had, you know, all of those things, but operating in the small team that they were focusing on at the time, they just told me you're not, you're not suited. Why? Um, looking back, I was upset at the time. I mean, you can imagine, hmm. but uh, looking back on it, were they right? 100% they were right. So, you know, learning experience, learning experience. Yeah. It, it's very interesting, uh, how they're able, how selection processes are so refined that they can pull something like that out, mm. you know? Um, and it's also, you know, you mentioned that people say to you, why do you even talk about it if you didn't get selected? And I think it's important because a lot of emphasis is put on special forces and special operations on, you know, these other things, but, there are people who haven't been in like a special operations unit who have an incredible career and mm. do amazing things. Yes. Um, and I think that it's, it's a great lesson, you mm. know, uh, for you to be able to speak to that, to say, yeah, I didn't, you know, like I didn't achieve this dream that I had had but to go on and do great, but things that I went regardless. on to do great things. Yeah. It didn't like my life did not end but because stop. of that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, um, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. I mean, um, um, I, at various times, I've had I've had um, I've banged heads with some of the guys in the community over various issues where I've had to say, you know, I've seen I've peeked over the fence into your side of the world, <laughs> and I've lived my side of, of you know my side of the fence, and the way you do things, kudos to you, you freaking you're a specialist, you're amazing, but you can't do our job mm -hmm. because the way you think and operate. Mm -hmm. is SF and you can't do for example mechanized infantry mm -hmm. without your whole mindset change because it's a completely different way of thinking yeah, right um and and i think that building that sort of um uh, mental structure has has, has it took me a while um to make that 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 mental adjustment and once i did i take pride in what we call being a mech eater, which is you know mechanized <laughs> What's the tra the translation is a mechanized sperm, mech eta. <laughs> but it's, yeah, <laughs> that, that, that translation doesn't work. People, the, the guys will know. Um, um, and, and we take pride in it. I mean, if you go and have a look at, at you know, some of the most effective units um, in our war, other than SF, it's 61 Mech, um, 61, 61 Mech, um, 61 Mechanized Infantry Battalion Group are formed in combat. They were formed on the border for a purpose, and they, um, and I'm a proud, I'm proud of the fact that I uh, that I was associated with them, that I managed to serve inside, alongside them for a while, bits and pieces during my career, and um, I take great pride in that. Yeah, um, yeah, and and you know, it's um, it's interesting because they are almost two worlds: um, the, the the specialist types that are the tip of the spear and focused on what they do and all that stuff, and the grunts who. Man, <laughs> that's not the easiest job in the world. They're no, sleepy out sitting in the back of the vehicle, you know. Um, different different mindset, different worlds. Uh, I want and I want to talk about that. But Dave, do you want to do the ad read real quick? Sure thing. Uh, so cold turkey, and I'm, I'm gonna switch this up because cold turkey is horrible on sandwich sandwiches. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll fight you over that. Um, and it's also a horrible way uh, to break bad habits. We're not talking about some weird mind voodoo from your crazy neighbor. Um, or, you know, uh, Jack's, uh, 32 hour special treatment that he likes to, uh, <laughs> advertise on his only fans. Uh, <laughs> we're talking about our sponsor fume, uh, that it's, uh, F U M. 
uh, and they look at a problem in a different way. Not everything in a bad habit is wrong. So instead of drastic, uncomfortable change, why not just remove the bad from your habit? Fume is an innovative, holy crap, uh, innovative, award-winning flavored air device. Sorry, my mouth isn't working tonight. Uh, that does just that. Instead of vapor, fume uses flavor. Instead of electronics, fume is completely natural. And instead of harmful chemicals, fume uses delicious flavor. So I'm going to tell you that I love our fume. I, I absconded with it. I've been using it. It's a great little, uh, you know, it's just an air device. It has like these essential oils or these flavor packs that you put in there. They're delicious. This is the um, maple pepper, which is sort of like breathing in a Canadian forest in the middle of a Moroccan, uh, you know, souk. Um, it's delicious. It's fantastic. Uh, I love it. And it's also a great little fidget spinner. It's got a little texture to it, so you can spin around. I don't know if you guys can hear that. Uh, and then it's, uh, you know, a little magnetic thing. So I fidget with it the whole time. Um, keeps you from playing with other things. Um, anyway, uh, try Fume. I love it. Um, try Fume.com and use code TEAMHOUSE to save 10% off when you get the journey pack. Try Fume. That's T R Y F U M dot com and use the code TEAMHOUSE to save an additional 10% off your order today. I'm not even trying to break a bad habit. I just really enjoy the fume. And uh, please check out our Patreon too. Uh, it's down in the description. And if you subscribe, you'll get access to all of these episodes ad free. So thank you, everyone. So, John, back to you. Uh, you went on to serve in three of the oldest citizen forces in the SADF. Um, Tell us a little bit about that, about your infantry career. And it's sort of like what that path was for you, because you did some really interesting stuff during this time frame. Okay, so came out of national service. And um, okay, let me take a step back. Um, yeah. At school, I went to um, I went to a high school called Maris Maritzburg College, which is it's a high school, but an all boys school. Um, I think you would call, term it a public school, but there's quite a heavy old boys involvement in funding it and with also a very proud history and most college has been associated affiliated with uh, the natal carboneers which is the local sort of um, um infantry regiment in Marit in, in maritzburg um for over 100 close to 150 years since i think 1864 something correct me if wow. uh, someone will correct me if i'm wrong um so the school and the and the regiment have been very closely connected all that time so before I even went into the army, I knew that the likelihood of me going to the Carboneers was 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 high. The probability was high. So I came out of national service, um, where it was largely dominated by Afrikaans and um, and of, of an Afrikaans military culture. Um, there were a lot of words that I literally did not know the meaning of, and I could not describe uh, um, them in English. For example, a beret. When it's shaped and formed correctly on your head, the term is hodem, okay? And it's an Afrikaans term that that was snatched, kicking and screaming, and pulled into English and Zulu and all kinds of languages because hodem is hodem. That's what it is. It's a beret. That's how right. you know how it must be all your uniform. The actual translation is attitude, which just doesn't work. It's not the same thing. It's hodem. So understand. So now I, I get to do my my first um, um, camp. We used to call them camps. I, my, my my first period of of um, um, of being in, in, in the regiment, um, and it happened to be in, um, I think it was April, um, there, there's a royal show, that, um, which is like an agricultural show, and every year the regiment would do a retreat ceremony, um, and they'd spend like, we spend like three days training, you know, getting all the marching correct, and, uh, you know, once around in, in, in normal time, once around in, in um, you know, um, in, in, in slow march. And um, forming and all those, all those kind of, all kinds of, of, um, of formation changes and that kind of stuff. So quite hectic practicing and quite sophisticated drill commands needed by platoon sergeants and that kind of stuff. And fell into, we dealt up into platoons for the for this parade, and we we fell in and you know sorted, you know, shortest to tallest, all the normal kind of stuff. And the platoon sergeant started and started giving us commands because you just come out of national service as a platoon sergeant and started giving us commands in Afrikaans, and which we executed brilliantly because that's what we were accustomed to. And um, RSM Schnell um, shouted from the side of the parade ground, Sergeant, come here! 
ran over and reported to him, and we mutter, 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 mutter. And Orison Schnell to the sergeant says, Corporal, join the squad. You, Corporal, you and our sergeant, come here. Can you drill in English, yes or no? And so I went mean, from this Afrikaans National Service environment to a, a regiment that has a, a very English tradition. Um, in fact, a cavalry tradition, wearing um, NCO rank only on the one arm and wearing black boots and not brown. And, you know, like it, it has from the British colony, it has, you know, a heavy English um, um, tradition. So we had to learn how to drill all over again, but this time in English, instead of like sit of Javier, it's order arms. Sit of Javier is literally put down your rifle. Now we've got to do order arms. And uh, what the hell does that mean? I'm English speaking. I've got no idea what the hell they're talking about. So we had to keep it from, from the beginning. Anyway, so um, so just to just that to illustrate the cultural difference between being a national service, going into a citizen force regiment was a major culture shock. Um, the I eventually processed this, and one of my mentors, um, somebody that I respect and and love a lot, is um, is Willem Steenkamp, who I actually only I read a lot of his stuff before, and I actually only met him when I went later to the Cape Town Highlanders, and he said it um, this way. He says, when you serve in the regiment, the regiment is your family. And he says, your unit is the regiment. Your regiment serves the government of the day. So you don't care who the government of the day is mm -hmm. because you don't serve them. You serve the regiment and the regiment serves the government of the day, mm -hmm. which makes it very easy. And, and why this is important for me to say right up front is that this is how we manage to serve through those most turbulent times mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because we were serving the regiment. We were serving the regiment, and it was the regiment that served the government for the day. We didn't have to have divided loyalties because our loyalties were to the regiment and the regimental family. And, I mean, there's some people there. One of them is, I must mention, is John Hall, who was, first of all, a SOM major and um, then became a regimental SOM major and later took a commission. And he took a number of us junior, we became junior NCOs under his wing, and mentored a bunch of us, and um, um, taught me a lot of a lot of things. How to how to manage um, the process of managing managing soldiers, which taught me a, about a lot more things than than just that. Um, I learned things from him, like you first of all got to be a good actor. <laughs> You've got to um, um, be quite dramatic in the way that you react to things to show I'm angry. I'm not angry. You're done good. You haven't done, you know, and uh, that kind of thing. And um, and then a lot of other things, how to actually to be an, a good NCO. And um, and I, I learned a lot of that. I grew up, I mean, for seven years, I had no rank at all. Um, I was a, a troop, mostly because I didn't want rank. I was actually, <laughs> um, so let me go, let me take a step back. Um, we came off, off, off selection. We were RTU, returned to units. And um, um, we ended up in, in five so a bunch of us that had been RTU together. And when we got there, the other guys were still busy with their individual training. That, so drivers would go off and mortarists would go off and machine gunners would go off and they'd all do individual training and then eventually come back together for combined sort of infantry training. And so we got there and we'd done a bunch of stuff and they kind of said, well, you guys come from the special force, you must know what you're doing. So while the other guys are busy, now we're like six months, five months into the army, we know nothing but whatever um we're going to deploy you so we deployed for two weeks operational deployment <laughs> the cast of us were training before we were fully trained anyway we got back and they said to us you can choose what you want to do what do you want to do so i said well i'll go for section leading you know rank sounds like it's nice it's more pay and whatever you know like idea went through section leading and at the end function we the end function in in the african context is always a bra you throw meat on the uh, on the coals but <laughs> it's never not a bra um, I had a an eye to eye disagreement with the sergeant who had been needling me the entire way through the course, and that I really disliked intensely, a sergeant Blom, and um, and he gave me an ultimatum, and I react very badly to ultimatums. If you give me an ultimatum, expect me to do the thing you don't want me to do. Yeah, do yeah, yeah. I was a child, and he said, if you don't X, Y, and Z. I'm going to send you back to the company and tell them they must give you the LMG, uh, the machine gun. What you guys call the M29 Bravo now? For us, it's the LMG, like, whatever, the mag, F and mag. Oh, yeah, the light machine gun. Yeah, yeah, the 12 and a half kilogram light machine gun. And I was, I weighed 63 <laughs> kilograms. Yeah, that one. Um, and I was like, okay. And he was, what do you mean, okay? And I turned, I turned around and said, well, fuck you. 
and I walked away. <laughs> Went, packed my bags, walked up the kilometer odd to Bravo Base to where the company was. Walked in, saw the company, saw major, and said, so major, I'm here to be a mag gunner. And he's like, okay, tune five Charlie section, there you go. And then the next day when the guys came in, now they're the new NCOs, they, you know, they were I was in course with and took over as corporals and lance corporals. I was the machine gunner. <laughs> and for seven years, I didn't get ranked until I, I just after I got married. I got married in in October and I spent two weeks on honeymoon with my wife and we got back for honeymoon on the Friday. And the Monday morning, I left to go for 30 days to Borsuk, um in Ladysmith to go and do my, my sex reading course. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's how I eventually got ranked because I turned it down the first time because somebody irritated me, gave me an ultimatum. John, can you tell us a little bit about the difference between national service and the citizen, uh, did you call it okay. citizen brigade? Okay. So, mm. so very simply, you had, you had a compulsory um, service that you had to give and it was divided into two, two um, 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 segments. And the one was, it changed. At times it was more and less, but essentially two years, okay? So 720 days, full-time, which was national service, and then 720 days, that was um, 90 days or three months every two-year cycle. So essentially it worked out to a 12-year commitment that you had to do military service. Um, and then... If you kept doing it, then there was a volunteer badge that 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 I wear um, that indicated five years voluntary service. So five years voluntary service meant you had done seventeen years service because the first twelve years was compulsory. So only the next five years is voluntary. Um, so so citizen force was. Um, I find that your, your American system you really struggle with the idea of of of. Um, the subunit level, like a battalion or, or a, even a multi multi battalion unit, you to, tend to look at like brigades and divisions and all that kind of stuff. You know, like eighty second, everyone knows the eighty second. Man, that's fifty thousand soldiers. You know, that's not that's not how we think about things. Um, so, so you know, we would talk about a regiment for us is is actually a battalion, but with the potential of 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 being a two or three battalion regiment, and that has. Like the Transport Scottish are battalion, but when the war came, they split up and became the first and the second Transport Scottish. The Carboneers the same, first and second are well Natal Carboneers. Um, so the structure is there, and and the concept was always one of um, of being citizen soldiers, and and it was an interesting concept that for every post in the battalion, you actually would have three people, in theory, that could fill that post. So you had. One battalion that was potentially operational, but you had three people, three people that could fill the post because at different times you'll have civilian jobs and only do short periods of service. So in time of war, that one battalion um, 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 units could almost instantly become a three battalion unit, could mm -hmm. become a, a short brigade. Um, that's right. Did I, yeah, yeah, that's right. Could become a short brigade. <laughs> um, we didn't think of it that way. We thought of it, you do a month in, in, in the army, screw them and you're out of it again. Can you get out of it? Can you get deferment? You know, it was that kind of thing. Um, but there was always a core group of, of, of guys who were committed to the service, who spent extra time in. I mean, at, at certain times, I would spend Tuesday nights would be admin nights, so I'd go into the army. And we would be running training exercises and we'd go on weekends, volunteer time. And then we do, you know, so... I would have a year where I haven't served in the army at all, but I've spent like four or five months of my time on and off doing work at, in the office, you know, or whatever, and then spending three, four hours at night and weekends and, 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 and on a number of occasions unpaid as well. So it was, yeah, you know, we had a fight once where they tried to control us by, by, by saying there's no budget for you to, to do stuff. And we said, okay, we'll, we'll do it anyway for no pay, the whole unit. So that was when I was with, with Cape Town Highlanders. For, for a year, we were, there was no budget. We did everything wow. anyway. All the parades, all the commitments, all the training we did without being paid. <laughs> and so, um, that was part of an, a kind of army infight politics kind of thing. Interesting. But, so you didn't uh, have, uh, I'm sorry, so you didn't really have like reserve or guard units in as much as your, uh, that sort of part-time soldier was more, they augmented act, uh, active duty units, units that pre-existed. Right. No, no, exactly I'm wrong. the opposite. Okay. Exactly the opposite. Okay. So for you, you, you would talk about a guard unit and um um in exactly the same way that we would talk about a citizen force unit. Okay. Uh, except that 
where you you would talk about you know your weekend a month and your two weeks a year that kind of stuff um we were never that organized okay <laughs> um, we were organized around the idea of being operational so what you would end up doing is you do like one or two short short sort of things during the year a weekend year for a parade or um like now remembrance day you you know that kind of thing but you'd know that you'd have a month or two that you'd be actually deploying sometimes the border to the war sometimes in the townships so your service was almost all not training at all but operational for a large part of it and then only for things like rank and specialist courses would the guys do an extra amount of service to go and do the courses and that kind of thing um so i think that's a big difference between your, your guard will be activated to go operational but right. the normal training for us we weren't doing any training you were expected to be trained you expected to be fit you, your hair was expected to be short when you arrived in uniform in, in order and we would the classic thing for us is we we'd get called up and we know okay uh that date you arrive there you arrive on that date your hair's done your uniform's in order your boots are shined and um you come you sign and do your paperwork for you know last will and testament the normal kind of um, bullshit paperwork and then the next day they'd have like two days of legal aspects because you know this is the legal situation how you're operating and what have you and they'd be in briefings and area of ops and what have you so three days in maybe four days in and you're deploying wow uh, that's it and then it comes to the last day you finish you stop if you finish your patrol five o'clock and you know on, on the last day of the camp you rush back to the base handed all your kit the armor sends you away 15 times to go and clean and possibly to right. possible stand your weapon and the next morning at eight o'clock, you're back in, in your job in, in, in the office. Um, that was it for years, for years. That was wow. how we operated. So uh, you can you can try and see the equivalence between them, but I think that the the mindset is very different. Was very yeah. different. Yeah, John, could uh, because this is also earlier on in your military career. Could you talk about yeah. uh, getting deployed to the townships and, and what that experience was like? Okay, uh, so. The first time I went to the townships, um, that was my, my first uh, proper operational deployment. So 1985, we were busy with um, with uh, battalion level training in Borsuk, um, um, doing all the normal stuff, trench clearing and um, firing of RPG sevens and all all that, that you know, platoon attacks, company attacks, battalion attacks, all that kind of stuff. And um, we had just finished that phase, and we were get told, okay, at the end of this phase, it's passed. Uh, you guys have got um, um, a seven-day pass. Go home, meet your, see your families. When you come back, we're going to border preparation, and you're off to the border. Climbed in the vehicles. We all had these like reflective bands you'd wear. We called them ride set bands, so we could stand and hitchhike. Climbed in the back of these of these um, of the Sommel 50s, uh, the, the military trucks. We were on the road, and this Gary, this uh, Land Rover, comes racing past, pulls over, stops the whole convoy, turns the vehicle around, go back, and we were pissed. We were really upset. Get back to camp and, like, and they tell us no there's been a state of emergency declared this is sometime after july in 1985 i can't remember exactly when um 1985 state of emergency been declared state of emergency because of um uprisings and necklacings and all kinds of things going on in the various townships and um you guys have been told you're gonna have to deploy to the townships We've done none of that training. We had done standard ride control was part of our of our initial training uh, much earlier. So we knew like all this this theory and what have you, but no actual training for for this environment. And the next day there were two guys there, two SOM majors, and they'd actually been contracted from the British Army. And they'd come and they'd spend time at the at the infantry school in, in Oatsu and teaching the, the, the teaching the teachers about their approach and their doctrine, their tactics, and their experiences in Northern Ireland and in um malaysia and in all the various places small wars that the british been involved in and their various urban quite counterinsurgency type operations and they actually came because we were the first guys to to actually be tasked with uh, deploying to the townships and they came and they spent i think it was about four days going through things like um well uh some of our soldiers when they were walking patrol in belfast you know, normally the, the 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 lady of the house would put out two empty milk bottles, and this guy noticed there were actually four bottles, so he reported to intelligence, and then they realised they must have somebody in there, and they raided the house and they caught the guy. You know that kind of stuff. Um, basically, how to operate and how to keep aware and what to look for and that kind of thing. They taught us that, and then they taught us things like um, you know how to move in an urban area, things like the caterpillar and the leapfrog and the 
with different formations and you know not to go too close to the walls and you know the normal kind of the kind of thing which was all new to us at the time and then a short while afterwards we off we went to port elizabeth um and we were um based there and we deployed into the townships around port elizabeth um if you ask me to describe what our role was how it was described to us was that we're peacekeepers we are exactly like the united nations that there are various factions there um that are fighting with each other and there were things like the horrible things like necklacing where they burn people to death mm. after a kangaroo court because what, they what was, was this was this intertribal violence at the time john no 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 this was um okay this was not case this was not um natal natal was the conflict was between politically between the African National Congress and the Encarta Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That happened to be um, Toza and Zulu mostly, but that could also be different. And that became and, and was an outgrowth of tribal and clan warfare, whatever. Eastern Cape was something different. Um, um, Port Elizabeth was something different. That was um, very much more political. And so they were not actually fighting each other as much as they would um disagree on someone being a collaborator and they'd murder them by putting a, a car tire on their neck and mm. filling it with fuel and setting it alight, that kind of thing. We call that a necklace. Um, there was that. And then what was really interesting about the time was that um if you want to talk about the politics, which I re well, really rather not, but but just in general, the African National Congress was banned as an organization. So you know if you said I'm the ANC, they would arrest you. It was literally was was an illegal organization. Um, MK and Kopu AC is where the Spear of the Nation was their armed wing. They were obviously yes. banned. And most of them were in exile. They'd obviously they'd been like Operation um, Umbrella and various things where they tried to do things and they'd planted bombs and various things. But there was a, I, I hesitate to say it, but I believe it to be true, a spontaneous grouping and uprising of a thing called the United Democratic Front, the UDF where it was literally the people who said enough's enough we don't give a uh, don't give a figure about politics and what have you we want change and what have you and they would protest and do all this kind of stuff and there was conflict between those two things because the one was looking for power and the other was looking for improvement in their lives and whatever so so there was an issue so we were there literally because the, the situation was volatile um, these kind of things, these kangaroo courts would happen often, or they'd decide to protest and they'd burn down a clinic, burn down a school, because it was liberation before education was the slogan, so they'd burn schools and all this kind of stuff. So we were there to do that kind of stuff. And in general, that was a good thing. Um, I must say that at that time it was where I had my largest crisis of confidence, um, as it were where I, I got really upset and 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 disappointed because of a of a conflict between um police and and, and soldiers where the police treated people extremely badly and i made a i went went via my saw major to speak to the company commander and i marched in and under orders and reported to the company commander and i started talking i said sir i don't think we should be in the town she said, stop 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 he says saw major take him out thought that was weird so major marched me out and then the major the company commander called me says hey john come and have a little chat to me an informal chat so i said okay now i walked in and he said sit down light a cigarette what's on your heart john we're not talking as commanding officer and and you know uh what's in your heart and i explained to him what i felt i didn't think it was right and what I'd wanted to do was go to the border. I believe that that was right. And what we were, what was going on Yeah, I didn't have, I had some issues with and across the confidence said, okay. He says, this is an informal chat. I understand you or what you're saying. I, in some ways I agree with you. He says, but if you're in orders with me, officially talking to me, I have no option, but to send you to prison for six years. So go away and think about it. If you want to come back tomorrow in orders, no problem. You're going to prison. Mm -hmm. And Obviously, I chose to keep my mouth shut, and it is the one major regret I have about my service is that I did keep my mouth shut. That that you you profoundly disagreed with uh, 
with soldiers being deployed no. internally in South no. Africa? No, no. It was more nuanced than, than that. Yeah, I mean, please please yes, tell us. No, well, well, yes, I do. I mean, your Comitas, um, um, your Comitas Posse Act, or whatever, I can never pronounce it correctly, mm -hmm. get it right, is that if you make your people, the, you know, uh, your soldiers convert the people, they become the enemy, and that's an inherently bad thing. It's a policing function. And I, I, I believe that then, I believe that now, and what have you. That was not my issue. My issue was that um, um, the way that it was being policed in some instances, I'm not saying everybody, I've been, got to be very careful here because because I don't want to paint with a broad brush. This was about my class of confidence, not I about other people so much. But there were, there were incidents on more than one occasion where the police were excessively violent with people for what I thought were trivial reasons and stupid reasons. And I just... I just felt that the way it was being done was wrong and I didn't have a voice to actually express that in any other way except to go via my company commander. So my crisis of confidence there was about that particular situation at mm. that particular time. It wasn't a political one. Even though the rest of my career, I firmly believe and I've argued it often online and offline and um, um, making myself very unpopular, that it's absolutely not the job of soldiers to police. Mm. And um, yeah, I know you guys, you, for you guys, it's hard, hard wired and written in stone. And I wish it was for everyone else because mm -hmm. I've seen the result of, of soldiers trying to police. They don't know what it involves, they don't understand it, they don't understand the consequence, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I've been back in that situation as a commander. And then I carry this, I mean, especially as an officer, I carry the responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if one of my troops shoots somebody, I'm the one who goes before court martial to please explain, mm. and um, that's that's difficult. That's that's a complex environment that changes like minute to minute and day to day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I can talk about this um, various sort of things that 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 um, various incidents that happened over years of of how this kind of evolved um, um, in the way that I think there became a realization quite quickly that the policing role. That was granted um, the army that was granted policing powers under the state of emergency wasn't a very clever idea, and it actually the beginning of the end of that actually happened shortly after it began and began with us and platoon force platoon sergeant our platoon sergeant and theirs um, we met up we were doing we used to do uh, twelve hours on and then twenty four hours off that was our cycle and we, we it was a Sunday and um, I think it was a Sunday and. Um, in September, the two platoon sergeant vehicles came together, and, and the, our platoon sergeant happened to be on our vehicle, Charlie Section's vehicle, and we came together, and we'd been playing soccer with the locals. It was a thing we'd do. We'd play soccer with the kids and, you know, um, com ops and um, communication operations and all that kind of stuff and, and what have you. And it was like, okay, listen, guys, the two platoon sergeants, one quick last patrol each in our areas, and we'd meet up and we'd back to our temporary base and then we'd be off for 24 hours. What's our plan? Oh, you know, oh, I met this girl. Now I'm going to have a beer, da, 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 that kind of normal kind of talk. And we separated and we went. The next thing we heard over the radio, just chaos. And we were racing over to go and find um, where, where, where they were because it was like, it was absolute chaos. We didn't know what was going on. So we just went to go and find out what's going on. And, um, and we drove. And as we drove past the one road, we saw down this road this like crowd of uh, pickings of um, of young young kids i would say estimate between the ages of about eight years old and about 14 years old 50 of them like crowd of them and we turned down the road and as we as we jumped off the vehicles they all scattered and disappeared amongst the vehicles i mean amongst the buildings and what was left behind was um was corporal faiki skuman and he'd been stabbed 75 times He'd been um, disemboweled, been castrated. He had a piece of his buttocks cut off, and um, uh, he couldn't speak because his mouth was stuffed with, with the result of the castration. And he didn't make it. Um, and he walks with me as a ghost every day. Um, and okay, so that happened. They called us all out. We went to what we called um, 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 Sun City, which was our temporary base. And the whole company sitting there, five platoons, so about 240 of us are sitting there. And um, um, the company commander stands up. Sorry, gentlemen, I'm really sad to say 
Uh, Gorskowan was declared dead in arrival. Um, and as he said that, I've never experienced anything before before or since that's the same. There was this this growl, this kind of noise. The entire company stood up, cocking weapons. I mean, we all kitted out, you know, seven magazines, 240 rounds, whatever. Magazines on, cocking weapons, walking towards the, the vehicles. And the major was like, oh, stop, da, da, and everyone was like, stop. We just ignored, shouldered past him on the way to the vehicles. And there was a, a legendary SOM major, uh, SOM major at Westhazen, Jake's Westhazen. And he was called Roy Bart, which means red beard. He had a beard like this size, which is very unusual for the army, but like this real ginger red kind of beard. And he just, um, he, he stood up in front of everybody. And just by the force of nature, he just stop, sit, and everyone stopped and sat just there. And they de-escalated and gave us like 48 hours off and what have you, what have you, and we spoke through and eventually got all got told the story of what happened and what have you, and they sent us back in. And we spent another couple of months still there. Um, and I think that was a wake-up call for a lot of people. He was, the, as far as I'm aware, the only actual casualty of death um, amongst the SA, SADF during our mm, ever in the townships. As far as I'm aware, um, and that that made an impact on me. That that really, really, um, that was part of my crisis of of of, of, of conscience, as, as I said. You know, yeah, I, I was yeah. going to say, how how did this sort of affect your life and your career, both from going almost being a borderline conscientious objector to then losing a man out there in, in such a terrible way? I am um... okay. You guys will know. Um, if you start talking about things like PTSD and, and all the rest of it, um, the classic thing is 25 years is that what happens is that, yeah, um, it hits um, you later. Marshall, um, who's famous in American literature or in the American military for, um, his whole idea about debriefing troops as soon as possible after the incident, whatever the combat happened, um, and the debriefing process that ameliorates and 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 um uh, reduces the impact blah 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 there's a whole thing and there's a whole theory about it and the other side of the theory is <clears throat> 25 years you suppress things and they come out without you understanding how and why marriages get destroyed people drink too much they crash their vehicles they do all these kind of things we all know these these things yeah well that's what happened to me mm -hmm. it, so, it's <clears throat> how did your unit deal with that after because i think i because, because I'll, I'll, i think i'll tell you i will show you photographs a platoon commander took us down to the beach and plied us with alcohol we got literally motherlessly drunk vomited all over each other and then it's like okay boys that's it it's done you good now let's go back into the into, into the game yeah that was it, it, it's but but what were the after effects because i think one of the things that is <clears throat> really overlooked is how personal combat becomes or can become at a certain mm. point yeah right that that it's it's one thing when you're in firefights it's one thing but then when uh, when you're faced with like barbarity when you're faced with these these things um or when you lose somebody very close to you war combat can become very personal and so now you have this entire unit who is taking it very personal and looking at it like that could have been me. How yes. could they do this? Like, and, and I don't want it, you know, to pretend that there's an equivocation that says that shooting somebody is better than torturing somebody, but there is, but we go through that equivocation, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that, Oh, we might shoot them, but we would never do this. And then yeah. how does that play out for the force? Excuse me. I I can't speak for for the force. Um, I can only speak for my personal journey, and um, and I know that um, the experiences that I've had, um, um, like this and others, um, have had a major effect on me. Mm -hmm. And and only now, I mean, in two days' time, I turned fifty-seven. <laughs> 
only now am I actually finding that I, in the last year that I've started, um, that the structure that I've built to process and, and deal with some of these things has actually started to come to fruition. Because before, it was a coping, okay, this helps me get through it. And I've never yeah. actually stopped. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. Um, the other thing is I got to see a, a doctor see that purely by accident. I was, it was purely by accident. My wife actually saw a thing about her in like the Fair Lady magazine or something. And she happened to be working like three offices down from where I was working at the time. And she was a specialist in post-traumatic stress disorder. But listen, I heard about the story. She said, oh, come and sit down. And three minutes in, she says, stop, stop, you've got PTSD. And I was like, no, I don't. Yes, you do. That's <laughs> <laughs> this and this, just for observation, you got. And I was like, okay, if you say so. Anyway, the point about that was the learning experience for me out of that has started almost a lifelong journey because let me give you just the one example. I don't want to take up too, too much of, of, of what we're talking about, but one example I think is very important, and that is that um, um, the, the concept that we seem to have of the, the trauma has to be combat is a fallacy. Yeah. The, the concept that we have that, oh, I didn't experience trauma, I don't have PTSD, is an absolute fallacy. And, and this is my explanation why. When you arrive in basic training, okay, you're subjected to classic brainwashing um, um, treatments. Mm -hmm. Just as a, as a basic example, um, um, you sleep deprived, which which relaxes your frontal cortex, which means that you don't you 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 stop judging what they're telling you, so you believe what they tell you. It's classic brainwashing. Mm -hmm. well, the process of of, of 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 basic training is a major trauma in itself. <laughs> so every single person who goes to the military who does basic training has trauma, and how they deal with it is is a whole another story because. You know, we all. You tell me if, if if this resonates with you. We're gonna break you down so we can build you up. Mm -hmm. Ever in your life? Right. Sure. That is that's, that's trauma. That's major trauma. Right. Because what you're doing is you're taking somebody's entire framework of values and 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 ethics and the way that they relate to the world, and you're destroying it, trashing it, and you're replacing it with a military sense of values mm -hmm. and um, ethics and way to deal with things. Even the 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 the, the action reward um, sequence, you get rewarded things in the military that you'd be locked up for in in, in civilian life, and mm -hmm. and that's the problem is we get traumatized by that in a way that we don't realize, and and how it plays out is now the other thing. I found it very interesting that ad read you did, where they said make making basically making a virtue of of something that is that is um, you know bad for you, and so one of the major um, um, symptoms of, of of PTSD is hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. Which is crazy. It's absolutely crazy because what keeps you alive in, in, in the battlefield? Hypervigilance. Right. You understand what I'm saying? So, so you can't say who's had trauma, who doesn't, who hasn't had trauma, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. the process is this. I mean, the Marines do this thing where they say um, boot camp is not about teaching you to be a soldier. It's about putting the stamp on bang. And we happen to teach you how to use a rifle, but the rest of it is about. If you've been through boot camp, you're a Marine, and literally until the day you die, it never stops. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. It's literally about that. Is 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 that is that we have this complete misconception of what is PTSD. And you look at the psychologists and their DSVs and all the rest of it, and they talk about PTSD where they make this equivalency here, but between someone who stubbed their toe and someone who's been a year in combat. And it's the same disease. Mm -hmm. It's uh it's and, very it's very experiential, I think, John. Like I I remember I interviewed a Brit once who uh lost his leg in combat. Uh he got mm -hmm. blown up. And he had processed that pretty well and, and was pretty okay. Yeah. But the the medic that treated him had a lot of problems afterwards because of all the trauma and the stress of, I have this man's life in my hands. What if I screw right. up? What if mm -hmm. he dies? You know, so uh, there there are all sorts of different things that are not, as you, as you point out, not necessarily you being in combat. It's very personal to the person. And, and yeah. it's hard for any of us to kind of, or, or a doctor, I'm sure, to, to put your finger on, this is trauma. This isn't. It hits people in different ways. Yeah. Well, well yes, I, I, but I think I mean to come back to you, the reason I went on this on on this uh, this down this rabbit hole is from Dave's question about it being personal, um, and and this is the point is that everyone's experience is it's like, um, 
and I will just test me as the most unreliable test you can have <laughs> because everybody processes what they see in different ways. Right. Um, it's like the my classic is um, your wife who will say to you, you can't find the milk in the refrigerator, but you spot a duck at 700 yards. It's camouflage. How's that? <laughs> right. You, right. You know, you know, yeah. 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 You know, it, it's interesting too, because, uh, you know, when you, when you talk about how it's different for everybody and, and for the therapist, you know, for you to just go in and have a casual conversation with her and her say you have PTSD, like we think of, especially I think like uh, for us in America, it was after Vietnam when they had all the like made for TV movies about, mm -hmm. you know, somebody having flashbacks or intrusive oh. thoughts or dreams that woke them up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. And it's like, that's not always a post-traumatic stress looks like yeah. post-traumatic stress sometimes just is like so much anxiety in a crowd because you can't track everything going on at the same well, time your right data is pinging all the time because yeah you get false reports yeah exactly yeah a therapist once described it to me as having one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake at all times yes. oh yeah that's what my fr a friend of mine called that being functionally fucked up yeah yeah, like you're like you're like hot, it. you're you're high functioning, able to do your job and work, but like inside you're having all this turmoil yeah. and instability. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, okay, so 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 look at this. So I've done a little bit of um of private security type stuff, okay, and some high worth individuals. And what is he paying me for? He's not paying me to catch a bullet. He's paying me to be hyper vigilant. Right. Yeah. constant threat assessments right so i can i can preemptively stop stop there let's take another route because that's a threat right so he's paying me to have PTSD. right like, right like, well, they say <laughs> kind of right no it, it's it's <laughs> absolutely true yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's absolutely true serious. and it's one of the reasons i think that a lot of times you see that a lot of the the people who are successful in the military you know, come from like sort of broken families and, and challenging time. because they have the hypervigilance, they have the compartmentalization or the disasso disassociation, like they have yeah. that going in. So they're squared yeah. away for combat. Now it's exactly. not great for, it's not great for like the rest of when your you're life. at home with your wife and yeah. kids, Exactly. but it's great for that job. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, yes, he has another thing to throw into the mix. Okay. He has a, he has an exercise for the, for, for the listeners. Go and have a look at the list of symptoms for PTSD and those for ADHD. Yeah. They could be the same list. Yeah. Yeah. So what comes first? Chicken or egg? ADHD gets PTSD or PTSD gets ADHD or how does it work? Right. I haven't seen any studies about that. Right. And I've been looking. Right. Uh, John, could we jump into talking about your time up on the border in uh, Namibia? Sure. Um, okay. So... Um, we were, it was, it was boring <laughs> in the best possible way, uh, for most people. So there were two main sort of things that, that people did. You would, um, um, maintain, you know, you'd, um, you'd be, be in a base and you do patrols in the area and you do various sort of, um, communication operations with people. And you'd go along what we called the Yachty, which was the, literally the borderline, they would have there were some cactus that would go along there and there was a, a, a piece of sand so that you could see if there were any square any tracks that had come across the sand and you do those patrols and they're all those kind of sort of area functions that was the bulk of what it meant to be on the border for most people for some people it meant actually going across the border um three different ways the first one would be an organized operation like ops protea ops daisy ops hooper modular packer there were all these operations that were planned operations across the border there was um um ad hoc sort of um investigative things oh yeah comes a spur let's see what where that's going okay we'll get out of angola again because we we're not supposed to be there and then there was <laughs> hot pursuit i mean that's just off the top of my head um so that was going on so the whole time you were you were um um just doing the normal stuff traveling around speaking to people um you know um, doing that kind of thing and then you'd be ambushed or attacked out of nowhere or you go into a village and and you speak to the head the headman and um and then you leave and then that that village will then attack you at night you know that kind of thing it was it was that very much that kind of thing um and that was most well i have some some great stories for around the fire from from there like um we were based with uh with 10 panzer in um 
um, in, Osh uh, in Oshikati. And ten pounds or so, they were uh, an armor unit. They had the naughty cars, the the French, um, um, the French airlines. And um, the armor and, and the motorized infantry worked together. And we go out, we do these night patrols. We had to do funny things like they would predict, okay, their possible base plate position for mortar attacks on on the various places. And we go and set up a temporary base on those mortar, those possible mortar places. So we go and sleep on those and to stop attacks coming and that kind of thing. But you know, you know what soldiers are like. About three nights of that, and it's boring as hell. So there's wild donkeys. So we had rodeos. <laughs> so one guy from <laughs> Omo, one guy from infantry, we kept <laughs> capture the wild donkeys, and then right, okay. There's no bridle, there's no rope, there's no saddle, there's nothing. It's just a wild donkey on the back. Go, who stays on the longest? <laughs> you know, um, and that would be our entertainment. Uh, a few broken collarbones and legs and arms, and that's fine. We got medics. That's why we have medics. Got to keep get them in practice. Um, or like we had, um, we had a talk with us uh, um, a chance later, um, and and we go and we get to a village, and um, um, there'd be someone who'd be the designated drinker for the day. And he would go in, and he'd go in with with the um, with the talk with the, the translator, and they go sit, and, the, and then the chief, the headman, whatever would his wives would bring, you know, the calabash of, of beer or uh, mango is, is their beer. It's sort of this really weird mixture of all kinds of stuff. Anyway, and they bring out the beer, and you have to drink. And that's the socially accepted thing. And so we do that. And um, but the third day, we actually realised. While we were eating horrible rat packs, you know, um, um, typical rations, our bloody translator, our talk, is eating chicken every night. And we didn't understand, like, what's going on, you know? And so then we, we, we then we already passed to watch him now. And off he goes, they go in the village, there's another drinker and him, they go and they sit down, they chat, he walks out, and three chickens come pick, 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 pick behind him. What he's done is he's tied a fishing line around his waist. 20 meters back with a piece of, of corn on the end so the chickens come <laughs> off. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, yeah. and, uh, you know, boredom is terrible. So, like, one of our big tricks was we'd have these these thousand-foot flares, and then the Air Force would come over in their boss box, these little almost Cessna-type planes. I've, I've never known what they are. And um, and especially at, at nighttime, they'd come over, and they see movement. They'd drop these, like, incredibly bright, bright flares. And so as soon as there's a flare, now it's like, oh, now you've got to pack up, roll up your sleeping bag, get in the vehicle, it's got to move again because now you've been exposed. So we hated them. It was like this constant cat and mouse game. So we'd wait until they came came over and we'd like three or four of us take the thousand foot flares, the red ones, and we'd shoot. And that guy, bah, 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 he thought he'd, the, the missiles are coming at him, you know. So <laughs> um, that was that was what war was like being on the border. Um, could, really. could you, could, again, um, I mean, pardon the, our, our ignorance, but for some <laughs> of the American viewers out there, could you explain a little bit about what the border war was? Because Namibia, previously okay. Southwest Africa, German colony, and then you were facing a, a, a communist insurgency on the border. Okay, so so just to maybe first we'll give it a sort of a, um, a framework. My father and I served in the same war 25 years apart. Oh, wow. Okay, so um, yeah, so that kind of gives you, he was at Katim Malilu um, in I think 66, 67, the year I was born in 66. And then I was there in, 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 in 86. So that gives you an, an idea. Um, um, so the concept is this is that Namibia was German South East Africa. Then there was then there was uh twice, both wars, there was a South African invasion of German South East Africa, because Germany was the enemy and, and that was that was the, the war. And um and in that process, and I can't remember the exact details, but it ba but basically South Africa was given a mandate by the UN equivalent, the pre the predecessor, the League of Nations, I think, first of all, then later the UN. That they would manage that um, as an occupied territory, like and administrate then it. Yeah, the plan was then to to have a you know a democratic election, blah blah blah, and and what have you. And and that was the plan. And then and then the politics stepped in, and various people um, got involved with um, rebelling against that idea, and eventually it became a kind of enforcement of we can't hand it over until there's actually these criteria that have been met in a bunch of politics. A big part of the politics was 1976 when Angola um, um, was taken over by um, 
you need her? And so many acronyms and so many different uh, things. I think the FNLA, I forget. Um, oh, no. Alden, Alden Roberta. F- F- anyway. F- Fenlo was wiped out by 76, 77. So it was at the MPLA and Unido were fighting in England. Okay, so so no, that was a transition period. That was the transition period. I mean, UNITA was was the, the southern part of, of Angola. The MPLA was slightly further north. Very complicated, lots of, of acronyms and, and various things. But essentially, the Portuguese uh, pulled out and the locals started squabbling over what was left. I mean, that was that was the point. Um, and then the revolutionary movement, the uh, freedom fighters, uh, that wanted um, a fully independent um, Namibia, not Southeast Africa, um, staged themselves in Angola and would then use that to then launch various different attacks across the, the border. So we had that counterinsurgency warfare. At the same time, South Africa aligned themselves with UNITA, with, uh, with Jonas Avimbi, who I still to this day think was an amazing man um, for a variety of reasons, um, aligned themselves um, um, with him in resistance to the other party in Angola that grabbed power and he was like a, a domestic that had basically seceded if, if you wish and so we were supporting him because that was in the South Africa's interest for a buffer against all the various uh, countries that were getting independence and hated South Africa and all that kind of stuff so what what we sort of felt was that we were holding the line we were mm-hmm. holding the line um, while the politicians sort of summing out that was kind of our uh, I think our mental justification in our process Except that then um, Fidel Castro decided to send 40,000 Cubans to fight against us. Mm-hmm. And there were a whole bunch of Russians who supplied a whole bunch of armament, armaments um, 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 specifically because they it became a proxy war. And I mean, yep. we saw CIA people and um, various very interesting guys with very short hair that wore civilian clothing <laughs> who would come through regularly. Um, so there is no doubt, even at my low, my worm's eye view, that all those shenanigans were going on. There's no doubt in my mind, and it's been reinforced later from various people who have spoken out about it. So we had this kind of concept of we're holding the line, um, we're protecting our our interests. I mean, who was it? We famously said that countries don't have friends; they have interests. We were protecting our interests. We were protecting our homeland. Um, Stake, you know, got all the all the all the stuff that we tell ourselves to justify what we're doing, and I, I believe that almost all of it is is in fact was in fact true. Is that we held the line, um, we stood on the wall, and um, the interesting thing is the the various conflicts between us and Cuba and Russia, um, the direct conflicts, because I think just like the Ukrainians have have shown the world that Russia is defeatable i think we did the same thing in a lot of ways Mm. um because we took them on and we beat them like a drum over and over (laughs) (laughs) Um, we really did um um uh, there was one particular time where um i think it was company plus um destroyed a brigade level um cuban led um um, grouping it was we beat them like a drum i mean we took strain in the entire border war we lost approximately uh, 760 odd dead mm-hmm. in 25 war um as opposed to thousands and thousands of on the other side so we beat them like a drum what do um, you do you think that it was a matter of strategy or a matter of the fact that you guys were fighting for your home essentially that enabled you to beat communism where the United States did, you know, failed in that effort, like in Vietnam, in in Korea, things like that. Actually, two things: uh, wheeled vehicles; they were mine protected. Um, that was critical, critical, mm-hmm. critical, critical. And unfortunately, you guys had this not invented yes syndrome, and we would we we try to tell you the concept over and over and over and over and over again about mine protected vehicles, and mm-hmm. until. Until I think it was the Marines that ordered the first twenty thousand M reps. Yep. Mm-hmm. You didn't want to hear. Yeah. You didn't want to hear. Um, so that's why now there is not a single mine protected vehicle, military vehicle in the world that is not designed by South Africa or have a South African on the design team. Yep. And um, there's a reason for that. We we learned those lessons, we paid for those lessons in blood early on. 
And that's what saved our butts because um, I happened to speak to somebody from the 75th who was in uh, Mogadishu, um, but prior to the whole, you know, um, Black Hawk Down thing, who said they did not operate, they did not move on the road between bases because of the mine threats. Mm -hmm. This is me and I, when I was visiting um, Bragg in 96. And I, and I said, but why not? I could understand. He says, what do you mean, why not? We fly. We have helicopters when we fly. We don't move by by road. And I said, but why don't you just drive? If your vehicle hits a landmine, no problem. You should place you when you carry on going. Mm -hmm. He was like, what? <laughs> Couldn't understand it. And we, it took me a while to process that the entire mindset that we had was, if there's a minefield, you drive through it. So you lose all your wheels. So what? Just don't jump out and, and set one off with your feet. Whereas the American mindset that I experienced in, in anecdotally was, if there's a possibility of mind you don't move you're frozen mm -hmm. so for us in our environment that i think is the was the biggest difference is that the whole mind strategy that worked so well all over the place did not work against us because we have the right counter mm -hmm. and the second part of it was the the wheeled vehicles because tracks require too much maintenance mm -hmm. um, whereas the weird the, the, the wheeled vehicles we had we had what we called tiffies, our technical guys, that literally on the march, while you're moving, they, someone would hop up on your rattle or on your biffle, and they'd have the engine open and would do stuff to the engine while it's running on the go, <laughs> which you just can't do with track vehicles. They are they require X, X maintenance per, per meter that they, they, they do. So I think those are, and there was an interesting study done by somebody, I think at the War College in, in the US, and um, that became a seminal paper that, informed your creation of your striker brigades that is oh, based largely i didn't know that based largely on the south african doctrine going into angola with our wheeled, wheeled vehicles yeah mm -hmm. and you know not all of your deployments were for war i mean you mentioned uh one where you were deployed to a hospital like got a rapid <laughs> deployment to a hospital for three days so i got the phone call i was at home on a sunday and i got the phone call about lunchtime -ish. And about an hour and a half later, I was in uniform and I had a platoon and I, and I was issuing weapons and issuing kit. Well, my platoon sergeant was, you know how it works. <laughs> and um, and we were ready to deploy. And then they told us, no, 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 you're a bit too quick for us. The next morning, and we deployed to the King Edward, the, the, the fifth hospital in Durban. And we got there and there had been uh, labor disputes. And um, the only people working in the hospital that were not outside protesting were the uh, mortuary, the morgue, and the maternity um, ward. Of course, people die or they don't die, but they don't care. And people are pregnant, they want to get born, they don't care what's going on. <laughs> Everything else is fine. And um, <clears throat> so we got there and uh, I walked, took a walk around with my tune sergeant and I set up, you know, observation posts and uh, assigned tasks and this is what we're going to do and watch the, watch the, the fence lines and watch the gates and blah, blah, blah. And then, then my job as officer was done. So I then go and I find the, the head matron um, in the, the maternity ward. And I say, listen, um, we got our soldiers here. They're busy. They had all deployed. But what can we do to support you? Because, you know, I'm thinking she's going to be like, well, put somebody at the door in case somebody wants to attack us and, you know, that kind of thing. She says, Lieutenant, come with me. I go. There's like four babies lying in a row. And she says, um, this is how it works. Watch one, do one, teach one. <laughs> she says, watch. Takes the baby, intubates it, does the thing, clear the throat again, and says, right, now you do it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and I did it. And so I ended that, that a bit. And then they had a, an overflow. I think they had only three, three nurses and one doctor. And the doctor and two of the nurses worked in the theater for um 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 you know emer um, emergency um, um cesareans and there was one nurse that was supposed to handle something like 20 some odd women who were like heavily pregnant and expecting any minutes and so i started helping her and then she got called into theater and then i had i delivered i don't know five or six i can't even remember any more babies <laughs> in a row <laughs> you're down there with the catcher's mitt john Literally, it was absolutely, um, and you know, and, and bang, here we go. All right, next. <laughs> right the, the next it was like production line. It was it was bizarre. 
And um, anyway, so somebody else got word of it and wrote it up for the paper and and used a pseudonym that was so obviously me that everybody knew it was me. And so I got all the shittiest jobs for the next year from my commanding <laughs> officer. <laughs> but yeah, that was interesting. That was, um, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where, where, you know, people say, well, what's like in the army? And you go, well, get, brace yourself. Make sure <laughs> that your arm is well practiced because you're going to polish your boots at least 100 times more than you're going to shoot your rifle. It's one of those kind of things, that sense of what the army is, is not what you see in the movies ever. That's like, yay much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you heard what I'm saying? And, yeah. and this is one of those experiences that I don't even tell people anymore because it sounds so freaking bizarre. Surreal, yeah. yeah. I, I think you know, what the fuck? And I'm like, <laughs> if you're there, embrace the suck. <laughs> uh, I, I think our viewers would want to know, uh, you know, we're all into foreign weapons and armament. And so what's the best caliber baby to deliver? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just so not going there. <laughs> um and I, I mean, then I, I would really like to ask you about the transition in 1994. You were in uniform for that uh, very, as you as you pointed out earlier, a very turbulent time. Uh, could you tell us what that experience was like from your perspective? So um, what was really interesting leading up to that was um, three or four years of the most incredible violence in, 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 um, in the tell between factions. And they would, I, th I, I think, jockeying for position, for uh, you know, the political position. So the ANC and Nkata were the two main sort of things. And I remember going and doing a camp, going from my civilian life into the army and going in. And I wrote a poem about it, about the one weekend hauling out like 10, 15 bodies a day that were being killed um, just in one little area that was a few kilometers away from where my, my then fiance was, was living. And they were blissfully unaware of the fact that there's a war being fought just over there. And they were blissfully unaware of it. And traveling between the two, you know, was such a, a cognitive distance um, mm -hmm. that it was, was crazy. And, and this is the thing is that all this stuff was going on and it would be reported in the paper and people would go, oh, no, I turned to the comics page. You know, there was a, a willful ignorance so coming into the, the 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 actual day of elections okay there were all kinds of promises and threats and and fears and you know the awb is going to revolt and um this guy's going to do that and this guy's going to do this and and all kinds of stuff going on flying around on, on all sides of the fence i mean you can't single anybody out it was everybody was was really was boiling and the miracle of the 27th of April, the absolute miracle, is nobody lost it. I don't understand it. I don't know anybody who understands it. That you came was, to the brink of civil war. It was, I mean, literally the night before. I personally heard people about, oh, this is not going to happen, blah, 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 kill this and do this and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the next day, nothing. Absolute deathly silence. Everyone was happy and celebrating and standing in the queues for hours and hours, friendly. And what happened that day? I have no idea. I, honestly, I don't think there's anybody who does. Um, <laughs> those people who are who are religious um, believe it was a miracle. But I say that exactly because across religions, <laughs> um, believe it was a miracle. Um, um, it was truly a miraculous day. There's no doubt. From from your point of view as a soldier, I mean, I think you alluded to it a little bit earlier that uh, the loyalty to the regiment. That did, mm. do you think it had from a military perspective? It had something to do with the love of South Africa and the patriotism for your country that so, that kept things from spiraling out of control. So yes and no, because because there's always been a conflict between. Um, there's the Afrikaans version for folk and fatherland, okay, which is for the people and the fatherland. Mm -hmm. Whereas in English, it is, um, it's my patriotism for the country. There's none of this for the people. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. 
you know what I'm saying. I mean, you don't say, you know, um, for the, the blue-eyed left-handed people, you know, and they're in the country. You just don't do that. It's, right, it right. doesn't matter what your criteria are. Mm. So we had a conflict. That's one of the reasons why the English Afrikaans culture culturally clashed quite a lot, is that the, 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 the loyalty there was people first and then then country second. Mm. And the English regiments made a made a specific part of our ethos that it was that we replaced the fort with the regiment on purpose mm -hmm. so that english and afrikaans serving in those unit regiments make no mistake that it kind of supplanted their natural for the fort you know for, for the people first and and we replaced that with the for the regiment um and i must emphasize that when i say english regiment what i mean is english tradition mm -hmm. but we had english afrikaans across the board mixed in all the, in, in the units and what have you so, so there were those kind of loyalty issues that were brewing, I mean, from the anglo Boer War stories and, and all the rest of it. That's been a long-running sore point between English Afrikaans to this day. It, maybe maybe uh, I should point out too, John, and step in, correct me wherever I'm wrong, hmm. that the, the, inter, the racial integration of the units, you had a few before 1994, like the Reckeys, uh, 3-2 Battalion, but then after 1994, the, the, the force, uh, when it transitioned to Sandif, became fully integrated? Yeah, so so the first black soldiers that, that, that we actually saw more than just one or two of in, in the common years was um, was about a year or so after 94, um, they started, we started getting soldiers. But what was interesting about that is that 1-2-1 um, one -one Battalion had been an, an all-Zulu battalion um, for a number of years. They'd been involved in the SADF for a number of years. And they slowly started trying to shut down the ethnic battalions that they were because that wasn't what they how they wanted the army to be and so these guys were now losing their jobs as soldiers with those units would then come and and, and started becoming part of, of 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 the citizen force units that existed so i had this interesting situation in 96 with the first black soldiers that i had under my um authority where i was i wasn't know why something like 25 or whatever it was and I had these 40-year-olds who'd been soldiers since they were 16 with no rank, who knew the drills better than me, who knew the weapons better than me, <laughs> who knew the doctrine and tactics better than me. Mm -hmm. And and that was a that was a culture shock of note because there was this social separation before, and now when we put together, this dude knows my job better than I know it and doesn't want it, doesn't mm -hmm. want the rank because I want the responsibility, but he knows the job. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating, and then and then actually starting to, within the military, starting to to integrate in ways that were quite interesting. Because what's so amazing about the military, and you guys will really understand this, I know, is that your social rank is, I mean, your social standing is your rank. So if you're a, if you're a sergeant, then you socialize um, military wise with other sergeants. You mm -hmm. don't socialize with a major. Mm -hmm. Right. Your social standing is your rank standing. So now imagine this, okay? You get people who come into the, the, the citizen force who have done other things in their lives. I mean, I'm talking about someone, and I'm thinking specifically, yeah, someone who's a professor at university and somebody else who's a doctor and or a lawyer, and they come in and they were well, a lance corporal. So in the army, this doctor is a lance corporal, this professor is a lance corporal, and this guy who's got a standard three, you know, like a, a grade five education is a lance corporal. You're the same status. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating, a fascinating dynamic. Really, truly a fascinating dynamic and in, in, in various directions because for me, I could go and I experience that and actually hear things at that level that I wouldn't hear from a civilian perspective because there would be a status disparity and a social disparity. Mm -hmm. So now as the military, I started hearing and experiencing things because it forced me into a status level that was equivalent with people who had the same rank. So that was a fascinating dynamic. And um, I started learning things and learning about things and how to deal with things there. That that was a truly a learning experience that I then started applying to other things in my life in a lot, a lot, lot large number of ways. So um, I mean, it literally made everything richer socially, and 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 um, and in, as a as a country, I think is that we started that social integration at that level, um, because the National Party deliberately excluded any interaction, specifically social interaction between races. It was against the law. You weren't allowed to go to a 
uh, a bar together or a dance together, or you, they literally separated people based on race. And so these kind of things where it's not like a forced or a or a tokenism or a quota system, whatever, it's like, if you got the rank, you've done the courses, you're qualified for the rank, that means you have the rank status, and I've got the rank, I've got the same rank status, and they are it's absolutely equivalent yep, and equal. Yep. And that was amazing. Because that was not the case outside of, of the military for a right. long time. Right, right. It's like this incredibly egalitarian type of force Correct. once you once you tear Correct. that one barrier down. Correct. Correct. So that was that was fascinating. I mean, it, it took a while. It took a while to sort of adjust to each other and what have you, but way less than the civilian sort of mm -hmm. equivalent. Um, way less. Especially, I mean, um, so in ninety six we had local government elections and I deployed that was Ops Jambo three. Um, I deployed with that, and I had all black troops. Um, my second in command was uh, was a guy, um, Corporal Talani, which is an interesting name, because Tula in Zulu is quiet. So his father named all his, his kids with the woman that he wasn't married to because he was still saving his money to pay her the baller, her bride price. He named them all variations of the word quiet. So be quiet, you are silent, you're quiet. <laughs> named, so that was what his name was. He was basically be quiet. <laughs> anyway, side side show, and um, and and we we were deployed um in the area of the Valley of a Thousand Hills, <clears throat> which is and and then a place called Tugela Ferry, and those people who know of it will know that there's been inter inter clan conflict there for hundreds of years. So within the so-called tribe of Zulus, there's lots of clans, because the Zulu nation was actually all kinds of different people. They were brought together by by basically by Shaka and his and his and his descendants. And they still have a lot of those divisions. And so there'd be there was this little village on the one side of the valley, this other little village on the other side of the valley, and the men would all go off to the city to go and work. And the woman would um cultivate the maize and look after the goats and the various kind of things. And the men would come back on 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 the weekend and the woman would have made them their beer. And while they're sitting and they're drinking their beer, the woman would start that man's wife, she sent her, I didn't stop her goats, they ate some of my, of my corn, my millies, uh, et cetera. There'd be something. And they'd get the men all worked up. And then on a Sunday, the men would pick up picks and shovels and machetes and, and all kinds of stuff. And they'd have a big fight. And the woman would stand on the side and they ululate. The, they do this ululation. And the yeah, men yeah. get, eyes get red, as the terms to do for the eyes get red, which means that the blood gets boiling. And they go. And I personally observed a guy with an axe embedded in his skull, coming staggering out, and his wife, you go back in there, you haven't saw that guy out yet before you, and you turn around and went back into the fight with an axe embedded in his skull. Um, <clears throat> crazy. So we were in that in that place, also a peacekeeping type role. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, um, interestingly enough, Almost no political violence, even in 96, that was directed at the process of voting. Mm -hmm. Political violence was directed at opposition parties. Um, if you go and you go Google now about political assassination, you'll find a place called Richmond that's right near that area, which is endemic. If you're elected to office, you're probably going to die within three months because someone's going to assassinate you. It's that bad. Um, it's really, really bad. And it has been bad like that forever and ever and ever. It's a particularly violent place um, when it comes to politics and other things. And so our job there was to say there's a certain zone around where the election is happening. And if around in that, then you will find out in that and that zone. That's our job. And what was interesting about it was the transition to the camouflage uniform from the Browns uniform hadn't happened fully, even though it was introduced in like before 94, it hadn't filtered down to everybody. So, but there was this thing, this perception that those wearing the camouflage were Mandela's army, meaning that they were ANC. <laughs> so our, my black troops refused to wear the camouflage. They want to wear the browns because that's a real soldier. And that was weird. That was, oh, so that wow. was one of the like, strange things. They wanted to wear browns because browns is a real soldier. And there was an incident where, <laughs> excuse me, um, okay, so we had intelligence from a certain village was doing doing various things, um, 
Um, and so we, the, the police we were tasked to go and search the village for, for drugs and fugitives and various things. So our task was cordoned so they could do the search. So there we go. It's like O-Dock 30 in the back of the, of the truck. And I got my guys in the back and I'm like, we ready to go. Yeah, ready to go. Yeah, yeah. And you can see him, the vibe starts going, the vibe starts going. It's all, okay. Weapons, stage three. I'm safe. Man, they know. Okay, bang, out the back of the thing, you know, stop, debus, run, make a big um, cordon around this village. Oh, yeah, all, you know, great, raw, 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 but enthusiastic because this is the task. And they love being soldiers, absolutely passionate about being soldiers. And so there I am, I'm, I'm basically squad leader, but no, not squad. Yeah, I'm squad leader, basically. Um, so I've got like 12, 12 troops, got my radio, the looters, the lieutenant's going with the, um, with the police to go, you know, and escort them through while they do the search. And I hear <laughs> shots go. And we're on the side of this little, this copy, this little hill. And I'm like, and I swing around to look where the hell the shot's coming from. And the next thing is, duh, 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 and my guys are doing fire movement up the, up the corpse. And I'm running off them. <laughs> I'm trying to talk on the radio. And the tennis, I'm just, what's, what's going on? What's going on? I'll tell you when I, no, sir. <laughs> I'm running off them up this bloody hill. They're doing fire movement. Turned out that it was two of the guys that were the chief guards. And they were, at, at what had an old 303, uh, like, um, uh, Lee Enfield from like, you know, Angry Boer War, 60 year old weapon or whatever it was, 80 year old weapon, whatever. And um, and the other guy had a 38, a 38 special. That's what they were firing at, were, um, at us with. And so obviously when the my guys started going, they were, they were, they ran up, up the hill and they were on their way. And anyway, so my guys ended up killing the two of them because, you know, they'd been shot on and normal kind of stuff. And I asked the officers, but why, why didn't you just chase them this? And they're like, no, no, no. You see, they're wearing a brown, um, basically army jacket. Yeah. They're not soldiers. How dare they wear that? It was that strong. They, 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 their sense of, of being real soldiers and yeah. identifying with. So that took maybe 10 years to start to transition that kind of idea and that, and those kind of prejudices, I would say after 94 to really start transitioning that the first 10 years was a, a learning experience, integration right, experience, right. and to put our own troops through the, the various levels of training and the various ranks and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, as that, that transition process happens, I want to talk to you about this deployment you did to the Congo. Um, okay. If you could tell us about how that came about, what, what that situation was about, how that unfolded. Okay. So I, tra I transferred after almost all my career out of the infantry, I transferred to, um, to the engineers because they had a uh, a post available as a training officer and blah 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 there was a whole story so i transferred the engineers and i'm not an engineer so i get told after i've done the transfer that no the opportunity that was going to be there for me is now no longer the case they've changed their minds so now well, I'm stuck that in sounds like the army yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so i'm stuck in engineers and i'm not qualified for my rank so i'm like I go to my to my commanding officer and I'm like, well, what do I do? Do I transfer back to infantry? He's like, well, I don't know. We have to try and see. And I could just see it was going nowhere. So I said to him, but what can I do that doesn't require this two years of training to, you know, how to build bridges and lay cement mm -hmm. and stuff that engineers do? And he's like, oh, we've got a demolitions course coming up. I said, There's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so off I went. I went and I did uh, combat demolitions and loved it. Um, I aced the course and I... Uh, I really, I really loved it. Just made sense to me. And we had a, um, and when we went, we went, I, I went back home and literally two days later, they told me, no, you got to take basically a platoon, a troop back up because it's um, uh, a birthday weekend. The whole formation is getting a big parade, doing a big parade and a big function and all this kind of stuff. So back on the bus with the platoon of guys and back up to, uh, to current stuff to the, the armor sort of formation headquarters. And um, we go through the whole parade, we do the whole thing. We have an end function, of course, we South Africa to be briar. And I'm standing at the briar, and um, one of the colonels on the on the, the GRC staff, one of his, his senior staff officers, happens to sidle over to me and say, oh, hi, John, I'm Colonel so-and-so. And I'm like, yes, sir. He says, um, I hear you just did the demolitions course. I said, yes, sir. And he came first, yes, sir. Do you want to deploy? Yes, sir. 
oh shit, what did I just say? <laughs> Don't worry. Um, um, I'll contact you. I'll get my office to contact you tomorrow. Da, da, da. We'll make the plan. And I turned around and I always said, I was standing next to me. And I, said, and I was like, what the fuck did I just say yes to? <laughs> like, you said yes to a one year deployment. So I go, oh shit. I hold out my cell phone. I go, I stand in the corner and I phone my wife. And I, I like, I tell her the story. Listen, I just agreed to this. She says, well, how long? So yes, she says, well, okay. And I can just hear she's, her mind is spinning now. How are we going to handle this? And, you know, what have you. So anyway, so long story short, go through the preparation. And um, and I go up and I was a month or so sh- um, I'm late because they had a, a post that, that I got to fill that, that they had they had planned to fill and the person didn't walk work out. So I, 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 I climb in the in the C-130 um, in Pretoria and we fly up, up to, the, to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We land in Goma and um, the new legal officer for the battalion was also there. And so we, we could get into thin, thin skinned um, um, Land Rovers and we drive the 10 kilometers outside of Goma to Meningi, which is the UN base there that was under siege so we stop there and we get out of the land rover and, and someone comes running up to us what the fuck are you doing what the fuck are you doing we're like what are you being there you are, over that container grab yourself body armor and over that one can grab a rifle over there grab helmets and go to the front you know it's the wall at the top where the sandbags are we under siege and we're like okay <laughs> and off we go and we were being hot shot at the time they had a um a 14 millimeter machine gun and a a couple of, of rockets and various things that they'd shoot. And then there was a a couple of like of of, of things that would, they would shoot like an odd times in the day. And then the FDC, the the um <laughs> the um official the official army of, of, of the Congo, because he has the problem, the M23 with the rebels were actually a breakaway piece of the army. The army base is bitten off. So now you've got people with exact identical uniforms, identical rank structures, identical weapons, everything identical. They know each other. They've been comrades in arms all this time, are now enemies. So it made things interesting. So anyway, and they'd come up and they'd have these, they had these two tanks and they'd rattle up and they come and they park and then they shoot everything from their tanks, all the ammunition, um, uh, main gun, coax, everything. For a mad minute, whatever, and then blah, drive back. That's their day's ammunition finished. That's it. Okay, and then we're like, well, what now? No, then you just wait. Then the infantry, or whatever, starts. They all shoot for a mad minute, like maybe three minutes, whatever. And then they're done. And for another hour, they've got to reload magazines and what have you. Or they might not for the rest of the day. So that was going on. That was their, that was their fighting. And that, or that lasted a while. And then we had... Um, we, we, we got some fire. We got to the, um, um, the, the M23 were, were shooting mortars at us and, and they were shooting these um, the, the Chinese rockets, I forget now, the 122 mil rockets. Um, and a couple of them landed in the base and what have you. So um, the company commander of um, um, Alpha Company um, was actually, the whole battalion was kind of put together with various pieces, different units. So I'm standing next to him. We became quite friendly, and I'm standing next to him. And he calls on on his cell phone to the general who is responsible for that area, who happens to be from the Indian Army. And he's general. This is Major Vic. Um, we're being shot at by mortars. We want permission to return fire. And the general's like, "Hold on." Doesn't put him on hold, so we can hear. So Vic puts it on on speakerphone. We can hear. He calls up the rebel commander, says, hey, what are you doing? Why are you aiming at, our, at my base? And the guy's like, oh, sorry, I, I didn't hit it. I, I didn't mean to hit it. So the Indian Army General says, okay, no, that's good. Just make sure you don't hit it. Back to Vicky. And, okay, they're not shooting at you. They're just shooting at, you know, in the general direction. They don't mean that you're in any, any harm, so you're not allowed to return fire. We're wow. like, oh, okay. So that was interesting. So that lasted about two weeks uh, where, where that would happen. And we get 12.7 rounds coming through where we were sleeping at night and, and, and rockets sometimes would fall on the base and all that kind of stuff. But the, the reason we were there is that the year before, um, the entry through the rebels had actually come into Goma and the United Nations was on a POC mission, a protection of civilians. So there are soldiers deployed who've got five rounds 
in one magazine, and that's it. And those rounds are essentially for self-defense, and that's it. And you can't tell me you're a soldier if, 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 if you have such a restricted round yeah. the rules of engagement. It's crazy. So this whole thing happened with um, M23 coming into, into the town, into the city, and all kinds of other political shenanigans. And so, you know, United Nations issued only for the second time in its history an um, offensive mandate. The first time was in 61, also for the Congo, coincidentally, for, for the Belgians that they did that parry drop into, um, 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 into Kinshasa. Um, and now the Force Intervention Brigade, us, we were given wow. a, an offensive mandate. So we were allowed to do hunter-kill missions without, um, we were requested to cooperate with the local army, the FADC, but we would, we, but it was not essential. And we had a full load of ammunition, everything that we that we we, we deemed for, um, um, you know, necessary. And we could literally do hunt-and-kill missions and not just self-protection type missions, which is really a first. So now we're there. But the entire structure there, 21,000 odd peacekeepers, that ent entire structure has for years settled themselves into the local economy. Um, and they've got side hustles going yeah, left and center. Yeah. Um, it just is the nature of all things. From prostitution to business opportunities of various things. I mean, you know, all kinds of stuff. And now we arrive on, on the scene and we are like, the bull in the china shop we yep. stomping on everybody's on everybody's you know you're um, there to kick some ass well yes and we're south africans uh, um you know it doesn't matter the color of our skin we are aggressive bastards yeah, we like yeah. To get, get stuck in. i mean you've seen us play rugby <laughs> <laughs> um so 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 now we're stomping on everybody's on everybody's toes so they moved us 30 kilometers out of goma we built our own base <laughs> of saki and um and we started operations and we started um, various patrols and getting involved in various places. And then what happened was um, the powers that be, the um, brigade and division level, um, um, came up with this plan that nationwide to coordinate it from different angles and different sort of um, acts of advance to corner M23 rebels in like three different places and blah, blah, blah. There was a whole a whole plan. And and we were tasked with going to um, a place called Ruchu, but actually uh, Kiwanja, a place called Kiwanja. And they ferried us there in, um, is it the, okay, uh, uh, M26, sorry, not, yeah, the M26, the big Russian helicopter that's like a C-130 with rotors on, on, on top. Yeah, yeah. I've got photos of somewhere. It's been a while. I haven't, I haven't thought of it. My, my apologies. But so we put two armored, like 18 ton vehicles in the back of that chopper, plus two platoons of troops ferried us over the enemy lines into Kiwanja, into a siege, into a little UN base there. It was manned by, also by, by a, um, a battalion of, or company or battalion, I forget, of, of the Indian Army. And so we ferried us in there and we in, proceeded to um, dig in, build bunkers, build trenches, um, you know, this kind of stuff, which had never existed <laughs> because they didn't need them. Um, and while we're doing this, um, Mary Metcalf, who'd been Prime Minister of England, she was negotiating a peace treaty and there was a ceasefire in place or what have you. So we saw the rebels that came up to within 50 meters of our base, stood there and like point their weapons at us and we're like, hmm, we're going to shoot you and then put them down. You know, that whole provocation kind of, kind of thing. And that was quite difficult. And then the ceasefire ended and we had various indicators. There was, you know, so the whole ops plan from outside actually pushed um, the various elements of M23 that they would actually come, that we would be the anvil. Um, and so that's what we had. We had three, we had, we were basically, a, we call this our task force, but we were three platoons reinforced with a QRF and a special forces detachment uh, from South African and um, Tanzanian. <clears throat> and um, the three axes, axes come together in Kiwanja and that's why we were there. And so one platoon was tasked with each one. And the one that was on the ridge line um, actually started taking contact. So that was the like the trigger. So the Indian Army had been tossed and they were in fairly decent APCs. They were full arm, small arms resistant at least. Um, they were tasked to go and actually 
um, do a do an armored sweep and and the crocodiles by fire in a certain area to clear it so that our advance would be would be um, easier to do without worrying about our flanks. Blah blah. There's a whole like ops plan involved. So what happens is we discover no more than 300 meters outside the base, just around the corner. They all parked hatches down, not going anywhere. And we went literally and banged on the hatches, and they were like. Go away, go away, sitting inside the inside their vehicle. So we were not impressed with them. So then the one the one platoon, a whole bunch of stuff happened, but the one platoon was taking like really heavy fire and they were like, This is not just a, a company level that is attacking us. This is this is this is serious. We actually the initial intelligence was it would be a platoon level. Now they say it's not even a company level. This is like hectic. We discovered it was discovered later it was was actually two companies, but the companies were like 500 each. It was like, you know, wow. So it, it was it was crazy. And they were platoon level and they were taking serious strain and serious fire. So QRF was called, QRF goes out, two special forces teams go out with us um, and got into firefights. And oh man, I tell you, I'll never forget. Um, <laughs> he was a captain, he was um, um, commander of the, um, the, um, heavy weapons platoon machine gun platoon other way um anyway so he had the um your mark 19. yeah that that equivalent in this african army that's made lo in locus africa it's the yankee two the yankee two i get them confused yankee two yankee three yankee two same as the mark 19 so you know what i'm talking about and you know that this the safe arming the, the, the army distance and the safe distance you're talking about like 30 meters 40 meters mm -hmm. he, he was shooting that literally that the shrapnel was coming back and pinging off us it was so close as wow. we drove we got it out of a market a little abandoned market and he wiped it out completely with that thing with just the, the shrapnel hitting us as he was doing it anyway that was the first thing that he did that was of note and the second thing is so then lieutenant lima uh from tanzania he was the commander of the sf detachment uh the general officer commanding the fib was a general maki and he was from Tanzania. And the night before, Lima and I had been standing and talking. We'd become very good friends. And I was joking with him. And I said, oh, you see, he's Tanzanian army, you Tanzanian army. I said, you're going to have his, you know, take his job one day. And he looked at me and he said, no, I never will. So what do you mean? He says, I just never will. And the next day, um, he was lying under a big buggy villa, with a thick trunk like this, and he was, going around the around the trunk and he was and he, and he was shooting and the fire came from his his left rear flank and hit him automatic fire one round hit his helmet knocked the helmet forward and the second round took him to the base of, of, of the skull and so he was instantly dead but none of us knew this we just knew that there was oh, there was, he was wounded and i watched and i've got video of it as well i watched that captain that i told you about on the, on the machine gun launcher under fire climb out of his vehicle jump off, run, make pickup, pick up Mlima and carry him back to the vehicle and hand him over to the medics and then climb back in his vehicle again. Which to me is the definition of valor. Mm -hmm. He has been, he has got no recognition for that, but that that, that aside. Um, you can actually see in the, the video footage I've got of the, uh, the, 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 the ambulance is actually uh, also an APC. And they pull and they try and come around this vehicle and the fire is so heavy that they actually pull back in again because it's like such heavy fire. Anyway, so that was a fight. That was a that was a, a hectic fight, and there was only Lima who was KIA, which was really fortunate because it could have been much worse. Um, yeah. So that was interesting. That was Kiwanja. Sorry, um. <laughs> no, I mean I this is off. this is the sort of like fascinating details about this stuff that like we just don't hear about. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. You know, people complain about the United Nations and what have you, and and I, and I say. Um, yes and no. I mean, you're right, but you're also wrong. You know, um, um, if you're a commander on the ground, um, I believe uh, very strongly that um, you command, you don't manage. Yeah. So regulations are for the guidance of the commander, and um, a court martial is for is is, is 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 his only checks and balance. And um, unfortunately, too many officers are corporate um ticket punches yeah 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 and i'm not i'm a mustang i made such trouble for all my hierarchy <sighs> because i ran to the sound of the guns and they did not like it um what do you think you're doing that's not your post i said i don't give a fuck 
Yeah. They shoot my troops are, 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 are in combat. I'm going. And they didn't like that. Well, the, the, the whole the whole no, the whole notion of peacekeeping is that before you can keep the peace, you have to make peace. And you got sent there for a reason to do yeah. that. Correct. Correct. So I mean, so so what they found is that they had to actually rein us back. <laughs> and South Africans became notorious for that. They had to rein us back. I mean, but there was odd things. I mean, um, I, I, my good friend um, made that that sniper kill. Um, you, he's somewhere in the top ten. It keeps changing, but he two thousand one hundred and twenty five meters. Um, um, it's on Wikipedia um, with an NTW twenty, but with the fourteen point five caliber because he did a barrel change for fourteen point five, and it's on Wikipedia as the longest sniper kill. But what it doesn't tell you in that is, as you know, you published an article about it as well. Is that it's likely that he killed four people with two rounds at that range? Into a crew. that happened. That happened there. Um, um, you know, uh, um, so much stuff happened there that is not spoken about, and I don't understand why. Because why not take his story and parade him around the country? Look at this guy; he's done something amazing. Mm -hmm. But instead, there was a court, there was a board of inquiry to find out who leaked the information. Mm -hmm. Which was crazy because everybody that was there knew the story and was telling their, their friends and, and family about it, and not just to Africans. I mean, across them, as they as he came as he came out after he, uh, they 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 reached reach our lines again, they were all calling his nickname like rah, 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 from like three different countries. They were cheering him, so this was no secret, you know. And yet they made an issue of it that I think was could have been a public relations masterpiece. So that was yeah. that was odd. So, you know, people criticize the the UN and all the rest of it, and it's our own fault um, when we do these kind of things. That the way that we deal with them and we handle the media and we handle um, the story and the narrative is bad. We just don't do it well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like the the Tanzanian uh, the Tanzanian uh, who ran out and saved the guy, the mm. South African sniper. Yeah, I mean, why aren't those stories told? Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, so so I think also some of it is a legacy of this kind of secrecy thing. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't talk about stuff, and you know, you'll be punished if you do, and and it's and it's just not true. Well, let me give you another example. I mean, when I was still publishing books, I published um, um, a book by by um, by Didis by um, Andre Dietrich, who was twice decorated for Valor, HCS, HC, etc., and. Prior to that, almost all the books and, and stuff would have this black masking across mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. And so I looked at this, and being the sort of Berkshire lawyer I am, <laughs> I, am <laughs> um, I asked, so where's the rule? Show me, show me, you know, who says I must do this? Because I don't want to do this ugly. I'll just destroy these photographs. No, this is nonsense. And nobody could show it to me. So I thought, okay, how am I going to force them to actually rule this one way or the other? So via a variety of, of, of people, I got it to military intelligence at the national level. And the question, I asked them two questions. I said, please make sure he's not talking shit in the book. So go and check that he's, you know, the operations he mentioned are the correct things. And also, um, please confirm for me that I don't need to put black marks across or tell me what the, the regulation is that prevent, that makes, they force me to do it. So they're okay. Took them a week and they didn't come back to me they went back to to um general nell who was goc general officer commanding of the special forces and then he then got hold of me via somebody else to say i've got your book here and <laughs> this is the thing everything that's written in the book we've checked it against the, the archives against the files all the operations are correct etc and the only regulation or rule was in in rhodesia the pseudo ops that the sas and others ran Required them to mask the faces because they literally went amongst the local population. There right. was a really right. logical reason. Right. That the rest of it, there is no legislation. So I brought out that book with the faces open and the names attached to the people, and a lot of people were exceptionally upset and, and were with me. And I said, actually, the way the law has changed is that you've got to be under the law in South Africa, identifiable by your face and by your name tag so that you can be held accountable by the people. Mm -hmm. So it's actually you breaking the law by doing what you think is the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, which right. Was, which was weird. Um, um, but it, but if you look at the books now, all of them are, nobody puts the black things on anymore because they realize they don't have to. 
So I'm always quite chuffed about that, is that um, my Bergson lawyer stuff sometimes works. <laughs> well, I, I want to talk to you more about the publishing aspect, um, mm. but let, let's first talk about like your transition out of Sandif um, after decades and decades serving in the South African military. What was your transition out of the military like? Okay, no such thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because I was I was reservist, um, I was citizen force, whatever, how, whatever, how you want to describe it. The military and civilian were in, inextricably interlinked constantly. I mean, every part of my life was inst was inextricably um, interlinked. I mean, I literally started a job at the University of Stellenbosch on the first of April '94 and reported for my first day of work a month later because I phoned up my new boss and I said I cannot come to work to start my new job because I've got to be in the army, and he said. Doesn't in Nationale belong? It's in the national interest. Do you do what you got to do, which was fantastic. But this is my point. My my civilian and military was inextricably um, interlinked all the way through, so there was no such thing as a transition. Um, um, I'm still I'm still an officer. If they call me, I go. You know, even now. So until I'm 65, that's just how it works. So I mean, <laughs> it was a pretty like seamless transition for like as far as your like retirement. Well, lack of retirement. Um, there are no retirement benefits for citizen force people. No medical. There's no retirement. There's no oh, social wow. security. There's nothing. There isn't. The, this is something also that is very difficult for people to understand. Most of my service was for passion and pride and not for money. Yeah. There is no, unless you were a permanently employed, full-time regular soldier, there is no pension. Mm -hmm. There is no medical treatment. There is no social security. There's nothing. There is no benefit whatsoever. There's no retirement. Just that is what it is. <laughs> but uh, so it, you finished your time there and, and then started uh, contracting in Iraq, right? Okay. So um, end of end of 2014, well, towards the end of 2014, one of the guys that was there, he was actually a commando, 5-1 commando, one of the special forces guys. He actually had uh, left the army. He retired or re resigned from the army. He was full time, um, and he had got a job in in Iraq. And what had happened is that um, ISIS basically overran, overrun, overran um, 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 Balot. Mm -hmm. The Americans actually evacuated, and the South Africans, there were seventy five South Africans, remained behind on the base, and they actually ran everything on the base. They ran the the kitchen, the bakery, the generator, the everything. They kept it going, and they slept on the, on the walls and defended the base against ISIS, etc. And then, so which saved the contract. And then the Americans came back, and then they realized they needed to expand um, the, the 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 specifically their QRF, mm -hmm. but the full kitchen on on base. They needed to to expand it, and then they did a rapid hiring process. And me having a friend there, he put my CV down and said, I recommend him. And that's how I got the nod um, to go there. So I spent four years there, three months on, um, three months on, and one month off for four years. And what what was that environment like? Because it's a little bit later. It's when ISIS is active. Were were there active like military forces in the area that you guys could rely on, or? Um, excuse me. Um, no. Um, we knew that, that that they were just up the road at, at Mosul um, um, and and various other little bits and pieces. But essentially, we were together with the Iraqi Air Force operating in a in an infantry role, um, uh -huh. um, and that was interesting as well because some of what we did was to train them um, supposedly to guard the base. But what we discovered is that they had this magical ability to kind of forget everything, and we couldn't understand until we realized that the Iraqi we're taking the guys that we trained and rotating them out to the units that were going to Mosul and giving us new guys. So we were continuously training new guys. And we couldn't understand these guys. We just trained them the other day. Now they don't understand what the hell they're supposed to be doing. And we start again from the beginning. And we were joking. There was some kind of magnetic thing in the gate that when they walked out, it like wiped their brains. And it wasn't. They were literally rotating guys through to take advantage of our, of our training. Um, so we would spend <clears throat> eight hour shifts where we do exercises, patrols, and training. Our uh, in training and training the Iraqis. And that's what we did every day or every night or, you know, every mid-shift. And were, uh, there, were there active operations in that training or was it mostly in a, like, permissive or semi-permissive environment where that was happening? Okay, so um, it was in the base. 
um, within that 25 odd kilometer perimeter of, of the base, we ran exercise all the time. Um, understanding that for a large part of the time, there were two of the militia units that were inside the base. So you and I both know exactly who the militia units are, who they're influenced by, et cetera. And in the period that we were there, they were going through the transition phase to actually be adopted into the Iraqi army. Mm -hmm. But there were two aspects to that. The first is there were quite a few confrontations where nose to nose at three o'clock in the morning in on base <laughs> with a kind of Mexican standoff and, you know, blah, 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 that kind of thing happened. And then the other one was, um, a whole political kind of process that wanted us to train them and a reluctance from the American company to be involved in training a Iranian inspired militia uh, or, you know, supported militia. And that all kind of, that all kind of played out way above my head. Right. Uh, I picked up bits and pieces of, of that, but the outcome of that was us actually building them a, a semi base outside the walls of the base. I mean, if you know, Anaconda, the big, the big gate in the North side, just to the to the east of that was we built a base to right next to where that gate is, next to the the the, 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 the Tigris River, um, and then they moved out there. Then they were happy because then they could do their thing and nobody bothered anybody. And then it was a lot easier. Right. But and these we, these we, were we the Iranian next. these were the Iranian backed militias that that were I mean the PMU yeah the, the, the our enemies but also the ISIS's enemies. That's right. Yeah. Right. They, um, they, they were called PMU, and then we had a change to call them militia. To there was some other some other term which I forget now. That was more sort of politically correct now that they're actually officially part of um, <laughs> the army, which was weird. Um, but they were the fighters. There's no doubt. They're the guys who fought the Americans. They're the guys who fought ISIS. They're the mm -hmm. guys who fought everybody. They were the ones willing to fight and die. Mm -hmm. So they had a lot of power because of that, mm -hmm. uh, irrespective of the political um, aspect of it. So it was it was a it was a fraught place. It was not an easy place. So, you know, we kind of took it seriously. We took our training seriously. I learned a, I learned oh so much stuff. Um, I just um, I I I was so privileged to have spent that time working with a bunch of really top tier guys. Mm. Um, you know, from the American side, um, um, all the all the like force recon and the this and the that and the, you know all this kind of stuff. All really good guys. Some rangers too. One of them was my team leader for a while, Al, who jumped in here to Rio Hato in '89, which was interesting <laughs> to hear. Wow, from. yeah. <laughs> so, so you know, some good guys. Yeah. And on the African side, some SF, some um, Peace Task Force, and all this. So, like, really experienced guys who've got all kinds of skills, and meshing those skills together and learning from all sides and what have you was fascinating to me. Really, I mean, all my life I'd shot with a chicken wing. And Paul, three minutes in over there to getting hit on the elbow. Hey, no chicken wings. You got to cock your elbow and pull your, um, I mean, uh, cock your wrist and pull your elbow into your side. And mm -hmm. I, I, it took me days to get that right to start shooting differently. Mm -hmm. But that was there. There were good reasons for it. And it was finding a, a common SOP between all these different um, um, eight type sort of um, hard charging, spear tipping kind of guys was fascinating to watch the process. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That's funny. Uh, so then uh, how long you, you said you did that for about you, like four on years. and off three and one for four years. Yes, yeah. And then w why did you leave that? W w could well, um, that was not my choice. I actually um, brought my family out here um, based on the fact that we were told we're going to have at least another year on the contract. And um, I left my family here in this new country and I went back to, 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 to Iraq and I was there two weeks and then, one day, um, like eight o'clock in the morning, I just come off night shift. I had this knock on my door, and um, one of the guys says, "Hi, John." He said, "Listen, can I have your weapon?" So I'm like, "Okay." I hand him, hand him my AK, make safe, and I hand him my AK, and he says, "Oh, and your sidearm too." And I'm like, oh, "Okay." And my sidearm, I'm like, "Maybe he's doing, you know, clipboard weapons, weapons check kind of thing." And he hands them off um, to someone I can't see, and he says, "John, I've got bad news for you." He says the um, the U.S. Department of, of the, you know, U.S. Defense Department, whatever, have canceled a certain number of lines on the contract. So that's one. That's yours. You don't have a job anymore. You leave tomorrow morning. Holy shit! And there were seventy-five of us that got the news. Wow. Yeah, just oh. like that across the board. Um, QRF, gate guards, um, mentors, trainers, 
um, dog handlers, you name it, across the board. They would literally just said, okay, line item, this line item, that item, cancel. Almost sounds like our the war in Afghanistan. Line item, Afghanistan yeah. canceled. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So my bags and I, and, I, and I come back here to a new country, I expecting to make some decent money for another year or two and, you know, build a new life here. Yeah? And now then I had nothing. So fortunately, I networked quite quickly and had the right kind of friends and started rebuilding my life here yeah? and getting a little ad hoc work here and there, making some money and started a hostel. And then along came COVID and knocked me down in my face again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, closed down my business. So that was done. And now I'm slowly building up again and, and, and we're rebuilding again and we bounce back and we learn from experience and we do it better next oh, time. John, is there, I just want to ask, you yeah. know, you mentioned you're in a new country. Is there a reason you, you left South Africa? Was it just retirement, a cheaper way of living? So you'll see that the, the modern years um, hammer covers scars here, defensive scars. It was like two o'clock in the morning and I was, um, I was at home on, on R&R &R and, um, I'd been reading to my daughter, um, who was six at the time, for her to go to sleep. And I, like dads do, I fell asleep in the bed next to her. And I woke up, something woke me up, and I sat up on the bed and I looked and our front door was right there, just outside her, her room. And I saw two guys coming past the door. Two o'clock in the morning, they'd broken into my house. So I stood up in the bed and I was shouting, hey, what you doing? And they turned around and they came into the room with knives at me and tried to kill me. And so I fought them off. Uh, while my daughter's lying here like this um, on the bed and I'm bleeding all over her and, you know, all the rest of it. And I, f f I fought them off and forced them out of her room into, like, the lounge area, turned on the light so we could all see, see each other's faces so I could see what's going on. I picked up my firearm, so I had my firearm in, in, in the waistband of, of my pants. And I said to them, here's my wallet, it's empty. Anything you want, you can take and leave. And I got inside the Uru loop <laughs> where they were like, ah, and I got, you've triggered an automatic alarm, which was a lie. On the sponsor on their way, which was a lie. So you better hurry up, grab what you want and go. And one of them was like, well, what's down the passage way? And that's where my daughters were. And I said, that's got nothing to do with you. I said, I'm telling you, grab your stuff and go. If you want to go down the passage way, that's a different discussion. Because <laughs> that's like, you know. And I ushered them out of the house, locked the door then called my girls out and they all were awake and were hiding behind their doors um, and stressed as hell. And they'd all just heard me shouting and screaming and, and, and knew that I was bleeding. And my eldest daughter was like, had heard them shouting, but we want money. So she'd gone through a, literally a piggy bank and a whatever, oh, to, shit. Uh, yeah. whatever money she was going to come and offer them money. And thank goodness she didn't. And, you know, um, so that whole process was traumatic. Mm. Um, and, and what it did is it's not about me being tacked. It's about the fact that four days later, I had to fly back to Iraq. Right. And my family alone. Yeah. So now I'm not there. And well-meaning people the next day would send messages and say to my wife, oh, it's so, I'm, I'm so glad John was there. And she's like, well, yes, but he's not, he's not going to be there tomorrow. Right. <laughs> you know, um, and, and so it made it worse. So we found, we found another house to rent in a, a sort of gated complex that was you know there was a, a bit safer and what have you but that started the the real process we had a whole lot of other reasons why we wanted to leave um systemic degradation of the of the infrastructure um the beginnings of like really rabid racism and blah 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 a whole bunch of reasons that that we really felt that it was not the right thing not the right environment for our girls to grow up and lack of opportunity for them but this was the was the trigger to the final decision to actually okay now no more messing around now let's get the process going that we actually need. can can I ask you and it's a really personal question if you don't want to answer it that's fine why you had your firearm and you had it with you what what kept you from shooting them why did you not shoot them two reasons the first one is the second I pull and pull the trigger it's a firearms offense which means that I cannot work for an American company in Iraq. So I lose my livelihood until the case pr proceeds through. That's number one. Number two is pull the trigger. I've got drywall partitions. My daughters are in rooms with drywall partitions. Okay. You and I both, when you pull the trigger, you don't know where that round's going to go to. Yeah. So in my mind, it was, if you cross the line, I'm going to do the thing, but you fall back and you're shooting up towards the roof and it's much less likely. But all this is going, you know how your brain yeah, goes. Right. You, the, the processing speed um, goes up, so your time perception goes down. My head is in combat mode in this whole thing. 
and um, I'm making those decisions in microseconds of and that processing. I went through my decision trees and consequences and actions and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I decided for myself that I don't, I don't, how I described it to other people was, I don't want my six-year-old daughter to walk out through the brains of somebody that I've just killed. Right. Yeah. Right. I describe it like that. I cannot describe to them the the, the, the decision key process that I had to go through that was tactically based. Right. Because people don't understand that. They don't. They don't get it. They haven't been through what we've been through where right. you, you you do a hot wash and you do, you know, um um an, an AAR and you and you process this thing in a really in a in a in a in a in a um cerebral way and you ignore the emotional side of it. And uh, and people don't get that. They want to hear the emotional. So I said, would you like your six-year-old daughter to walk through someone's brains you've just killed? Right. And people, people understand that. They don't understand the 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 the, the, the cerebral side of it at all. The yeah, side you had to make it. a decision in half a second. It, in, in, South, in South Africa, you know, I, and I don't know if it's a, like, if it's a federal or a nationwide thing or if it's like by the districts or states or however it's, it's broken down, but would you have been within your legal right to have shot them after they broke in with, with knives or the, not really? Okay, so the policemen, <laughs> two black policemen who arrived um, on the scene when I reported it were absolutely m mad with me that I had not shot them. Uh -huh. Because they were like, now we're going to have a problem because they're going to keep on doing this stuff and we've got to chase them and someone else is not going to be able to do it and they're going to kill somebody and why didn't you shoot them? We do some paperwork and it's done. Uh -huh. That was issued from from the police. So for me, self defense comes down to one very basic thing: imminent threats. Uh -huh. If I personally, I'm not talking legally, morally and ethically, if I had pulled out my weapon and and shot them when they were trying to kill me with their knives, I would have been 100% legally justified and morally justified. Uh -huh. The second they stopped doing that, I no longer was. Uh -huh. I could have faked it easily, right? But I would have not liked that. Right. Even when they made the threat to my daughter, now the imminent threat is back. Right. Properly kill them and go on with my day. Right. You, know, you, you understand the process that I was going through? Absolutely. So yeah. It changes from second to second as you go through and you evaluate what's the threat now. Oh, it's elevated. It's not elevated. I'm going to get out of trouble. Oh, no, I'm going to have to shoot them. I went through that process like numerous times in that yeah. very short of time. Yeah. 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 I hope that makes sense. No, yeah. it does. That's that's a tough decision to make. I mean, it's an impossible decision to make. And, really. and sorry to hear that your family went through that. I'm sure it was very traumatic for for them also. Extremely, yeah, yes, extremely. Mm. Yeah, but you know, South Africans are, are we're tough. We we've got a we've got a, a sort of a saying. Well, a couple of sayings. The one is "fuss bait lacano," which is bite bite down. It'll be nice now. So grit your teeth. You know, you'll be nice now. But the one I prefer is "kijk noord and fok voor," which is look north and. Fuck, a, fuck off ahead. So, <laughs> it means ignore the flanks, um, have the bugler sound the charge, and off we go. <laughs> and that's like, a, that's, that's a fact in a way, I think, in a lot of ways. So, but that's what we You relocated your family and uh, moved on to new endeavors. I, I want to take a, a little sidebar here to talk about your career in publishing. Uh, mm. how, how did you get into that? And like, what did you publish? Well, I mean, what, what was, yeah, tell us about that. That's 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 very simple. What happened is that um, uh, um, I mentioned his name before when I was at the Cape Town Highlanders, Willem Steenkamp, who was his uh, a historian and what have you, happened to be a captain in the Cape Town Highlanders, and him and I became good friends. He became my mentor for a lot of things, especially when I made the transition from NCO to officer. Um, I'll never forget talking about sidebars <laughs> um, when I was. Um, I pointed as candidate officer how it worked. I was in the, the, the warrant officers and sergeants mess, and we all dressed up. It's our sort of monthly function, and we all got our fancy uniforms on, um, kilts and, and, and dirks and all. And there's this bang, bang, bang at the door, and it's the um, the commanding officer with a bunch of officers, and he and the RSM, who's the, the head of the of the mess, obviously, and he calls out. Who is it? Who dares disturb my meeting? <laughs> and the the, the, the commanding officer is like, RSM, it is I, your commanding officer. They're playing this game. It's like they're honestly playing this game. And he's like, reluctantly, Sergeant, will you open the door? <laughs> and he goes and opens the door, and the commanding officer comes in, and the RSM turns around to, 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 the, to us, to the, uh, to the mess, and he goes, Who's the traitor? And he pulls out his dirt. Who 
who's the traitor? And I'm like, it was me and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Chris, yeah, him, come here. And he, come, and he comes and he slices off our, 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 our sergeant's ranks and like throws them on the table and says, go see, they're yours now. And we go over to him and he puts on our like white tags for Canada officers like this and he leads us out. And um, as we go out, the RSM shouts at us, and there to return. <laughs> and now we know, like, we know as we're now going to the, the officer's mess. Anyway, so, so it was, it was like, it was fantastic. It was like theater. It was, but the whole point of it is something that, that Willem points out to me later. He says, the idea is to make the shift from being an NCO to take commission is a much larger shift than you can imagine until you go through it. And he says, this is why he says, Yes, advice. There's two pieces of advice I can give you becoming an officer. The first one is three most important words an officer can ever utter are carry on, sergeant. <laughs> okay. In other words, tell your sergeant what to do, not how to do it. That's that's the whole philosophy and what have you. So that's how you do that. But here's the other thing. He says every he's told me, and I've I've taken this on board as my personal philosophy. Every time you get an, get a, an order from a senior officer to you. The first words out of your mouth, but rather not keep them in your brain, must be "fuck you." <laughs> so your initial, your instinctive reaction must be, when you receive an order, must be "fuck you," and that sounds weird, but here's what it means. He says you have an obligation and a duty to only execute lawful, legal orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So your reaction must be first to object. Right. And then figure out, okay, you've given me an order. What is legal about it? Not accept the order and then say, oh, but this is illegal. And that's the mindset you have to have. He says, well, this is how it works. As an NCO, you receive an order, you must carry it out. End of story. If it's illegal, you, you will say, I can't because it's illegal. And that, that's it. But as an officer, not only do you have to carry out an order you're given, you've got to accept responsibility for commanding those below you. So you are not just passing on the order, you're actually responsible for mentally processing it and then issuing the order because the commission by definition gives you the authority of the government. Whereas an NCO does not have that authority. They operate under the ag um, uh, aegis of an, of, of an officer, of a commissioned officer. That's what commission's about. And, but it's summed up by the first thing is fuck you. <clears throat> and the whole process behind it is really a heavy process. But it's summed up by that attitude. Okay, so him and I were good friends, and he'd published some books before. And he was struggling. He wanted to bring out a new version of his book because he'd used a bunch of pseudonyms the first time because they're still politically sensitive. And um, um, a military book. And um, and I said, well, I'll try and help you. You know, see what I can do. So I took his book, and then in the process, I was moving up to back up to Durban, and I figured out um, how to do the editing for him. I prepared the documents. I was going to stop there. And then I realized, oh, but there's this new thing, print on demand. There's lulu.com. And I then said, oh, Villain, this we can try and do this thing, self-published. And he was like, okay, it sounds good. Let's do it. And we did it. And that's how it started. I did the first book and that's how it started. So um, I then came up, the next thing I came up with was like a mission vision kind of statement, which was, and I believe this passionately, is that, the stories of the people are the history of the nation. Mm -hmm. And I believe that passionately because um, when histories are written by historians, they look at these, you know, people in positions that are um, um, generals and, and, and politicians and, and, and not necessarily power because people are themselves in power as well. They, I avoided, I used my, picked my words quite carefully. They're, that are in this higher position. They look at it sort of from an eagle, uh, eagle eyes view looking down on it over the over time and all the rest of us and and uh, but i believe that the real history is the worm's eye view so it's the ordinary person who writes the story of the ordinary person um and that's the equivalent of the ar archaeologist going through the midden heap and finding you know a broken piece of pottery we're in the modern age we don't leave broken pottery we can leave a whole story of and and, my, and the best example i have is i did these two different books the one was um, the story of a guy who did his national service as a chef. And you have to understand, everybody did basic training. Everyone learned how to, how to drill, how to um, use a weapon, et cetera, et cetera. So, but then after that, his individual training was to be a chef. And this was, his, was the story of his army, his two years in the army. And 
the anecdotes of what happened to him and the friends around him and the you know the ups and downs it was an army story and was his was his story that was on the one hand on the other hand i published a book by um colonel andre dietrich nicknamed didis he was twice decorated for valor with the norris crook silver and the norris crooks he was a recce special forces um, um officer who um was he epitomized the the um small teams concept you developed and extended the small teams concept um etc 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 two different books that are the stories of the people and when you do the history which one's more important and i i believe neither i believe the more we can get of those stories and this is what i believe and this is literally why i started doing the publishing um, was to tell people stories. So I did a lot of autobiographies and and what have you of various people. I mean, across the spectrum, probably 70, 30% military versus non-military, because that's the people I know. <laughs> but we did a whole bunch of books and we, we were doing, oh, sometimes 150, 200 books in a year, which is wow. oh, man. huge amount. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we had to do it because that was what 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 we had to do to make, um, make ends meet, because we might sell 10 copies of a book ever. So you put in all that work and you only sell 10 copies. It means you've got to have a lot of titles to be able to make up, you know, enough to actually make enough money to put food on the table. Where uh, so, where can people find these books, John? Well, I mean, I, I'm not doing it anymore, but most of them are either on Lulu or on Amazon. Um, but I'm not actively um, doing them anymore. There are a couple of books that still sell, like Jack Creer's book, um, um, A Greatest Share of Honor. We still print in small numbers, 20, uh, 20 to 30 at a time deliver to him and, and he'll then send them to people that when he goes and he talks somewhere or something that he'll sell them. But his book is available on Lulu.com. You just have to Google it. I mean, you, you know, if you want to know what you're looking for, you'll find it. Um, the company, my company was just done production because I'm John Dovey, JD, just done. So <laughs> that made sense. And the, the motto was, if you want it done, it's just done. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, yeah. Anyway, I thought that was amusing. Um, but we stopped that and we left because uh, changing countries, you know, laws and admin and tax and that, all that stuff doesn't work. So we do it. We help people out um, now with um, if they want to publish stuff, we'll format it for them, uh, help them get it onto, onto Amazon, that kind of stuff. But it's not our primary business anymore, between my wife and I. She's doing uh, online stuff with, um, um, she basically, organizes and runs people's um, online presence and, and what have you. And I'm doing bits and pieces to keep food on the table. And then when I get uh, when I get some um, security type stuff, then I do it. And that's why I do all these like funny little jobs. Hey, you know, are there any uh, of these more recent adventures that you've had since you've relocated that you'd like to talk about before uh, we get out of here tonight? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, just, just as a, uh, you know, just maybe to, 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 to show the sort of scope of things. I mean, I had some, I had an occasion where somebody was um, working for one of the, uh, uh, the liners, you know, the, uh, the pleasure cruises, the, yeah. the big boats. Yeah, yeah. And they'd had an, an injury on duty in IOD. And, um, um, and so the, the, the company put them up in a, a really nice hotel while they waited for something to go through for, for, for this person to get treatment and what have you. But they were suspicious that maybe there was a fake injury. So I was booking to suite next to this person that had surveilled them and followed them on the street and all this kind of stuff, which I wasn't very good at because that's not my my thing. So anyway, so that was that was the one that was one tiny little job I did for like four days. You and, know? and you um, caught them doing backflips off the high dive board. Well, yes, it wasn't quite that bad, but it was like you know <laughs> walking without any kind of pain, you know, meeting up with yeah, a boyfriend, yeah, yeah. all that kind of stuff. And then I've done another thing where. Um, I escorted a well. I arranged a, a, a trip and escort for a bunch of geologists into the Darien, um, where they got to ride on one of those, um, like really those hollowed out log boats with some, with some of the local people and um, bang rock, rocks with hang, ha with hammers and sniff them and they go, oh you smell that and stick it in my nose and I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm conscious of it's the organics, it's the organics, it's million years old oil that's in these rocks and so that was fascinating and. Oh, man, I've served papers on, on people for, you know, the normal kind of stuff. They've been doing naughty suit shenanigans and they get served papers or um, um, I've done, you know, all kinds of bits and pieces. Um, there's one client who he arrives here in his private jet and then he's got a rule. He does not sit in a vehicle for more than 21 minutes. 
So if the traffic's going to make it more than 21 minutes, we fire the chopper up. So that's $3,000 to turn on the helicopter, take him, <laughs> man, not even seven kilometers. <laughs> and then we're picking up with the armored vehicles and take him to a hotel and, you know, look after him, what have you, for a couple of days. So it's all these different bits and pieces. It's it's fun. I'm, I'm having I'm having a great time when it, when it comes through. And, and you've also taken up photography. Yeah, I was just saying to somebody a bit earlier, um, I just got myself literally yesterday or day before, um, EOS R5, so it's, a, it's really a nice professional level camera. But I was saying to somebody, I was walking on the beach um, at dawn two mornings ago, and I was like taking of the sunset and the waves and all the rest of it, and kind of the sun was up, and I was like, okay, it's boring, I've done what I'm going to do, and I'm walking with the camera, and I catch him out the side of my eye, and I pick the camera up, and I go like this. And I, when I looked at the photo later on, man, there it is, smack bang in the middle is this bird in flight. And I was explaining to to the person I was talking to, I was like, these are the old skills. Yeah. This yeah, is yeah, yeah. this is uh, man, this is reflective shooting. It's all uh, the same old, old skills. Bam. So now what I and the reason I actually got the camera is actually for this reason is that um, you know, we were talking about excuse me, about how um um hypervigilance is good and bad depending on circumstance. So all this stuff that I spent so much time of my life trying to perfect and building muscle memory for, and which I'll never use unless the you know zombie ap- apocalypse happens. <laughs> um, let me transfer that to something that is peaceful, enjoyable, gets right. me out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About, don't you know pull the blanket over my head because the end of the world is yeah. I, you know I do this thing, and I'm so, so excited about it. And it's, it's I think it's like really cool. The fact that I produce photographs at the end is kind of a bonus. It's the process. That's the yeah yeah you know. The process being the punishment, the process is the pleasure. So, yeah, I'm having fun, John. I mean, uh, any like, I mean, oh my word, I've lived my whole life with, with a shaven head. I'm great, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm just doing it because I can for no other reason. Yeah, I mean, living life, man. Yeah, exactly. It's very uh, cool. You know, as we we reflect back on you know decades of military service and out of military, I mean, do you have any final thoughts? Any big tech takeaways, lessons learned that you'd like to share with people? Brothers, brothers. Um, what I've come to learn is that is that um, the most important thing for us at this age and this stage of our lives is to make sure we look after our brothers. I've lost about 47 of my brothers in the last six years to suicide accidents and various other things. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm tired of it. I'm really tired of it. And that's why, um, to me, uh, I will advocate always speak. And this is why I talk is because if we speak about it, it means that it normalizes it. Right. The fact that I, um, and I will tell people that, um, you know, my daughters tell me, because I always say, well, What's the problem? People say, and, and my daughters will say, you look scary. And I'm like, what do you mean scary? I'm a teddy bear. And they're like, no, you look scary. And I'm not scary. I'm, uh, it, you, you understand what I'm what I'm saying? So the perception is is, is weird. And and so um, I try as much as I can to advocate that we, not necessarily in public, but that we speak to each other as yeah, men yeah. or as veterans, honestly, honestly. And we mm-hmm. actually speak mm-hmm. about emotions, which we normally don't do. So um, I, I had this conversation with somebody the other day, and I said, and they're like, "Hey, how are you, brother? Doing a check-in?" I said, "I'm, I'm sad." And they go, "Oh, that's, that's not good." And I said, "No, no, 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 no. I'm sad, but I'm learning to be okay with that." Right. Right. And that's the difference. It's yeah. not you got enough to make me happy. I've got to learn to be okay with it. I've got to learn to accept. Okay, so this guy. Uh, something bad happened to him and I miss him like so bad he was like he was my brother he was my buddy and I miss him I'm sad about the fact that he that he ended up doing what he did to, you know to end it all that's not going to change right I'm getting sad this today this today 11th of the 11th is the day I cry yeah like tears because that's the day I allow myself to be okay with being sad right and I believe passionately that we need to we as brothers need to remember that we support each other that no matter what that we talk to each other honestly we don't talk shit we talk honestly right. it's not about when you sit around and cry and what have you but it's like when you're feeling crap then you say i'm feeling crap and why right you don't like i'm fine you don't do that stuff right you know? and then then the last part is the lesson is 
that all the stuff we talk about, about post-traumatic stress and the this and that and all the rest of it, what it comes down to for me is about us discovering ways, mechanisms, that we can deal with it in a healthy way. And I think the more we explore these topics together, the more we talk about our history and things that happened to us and how they affected us. And like we, we were talking about that, it's it's a personal thing and your reaction is different depending on who you are. And the medic um, was traumatic, traumatized, not the guy who lost his leg. The more we talk about these things, the more people, the more our, our brotherhood can realize that's okay. Yeah, they're not alone. You're not alone. Um, you're not the, the CAG operator or the, you know, the this or that. You're the chef. But your trauma is as real right. as that guy and what have you. Yep. And it's right. okay. It's okay. You're not, we, we don't want to have a pity party. We don't want to do all that stuff. But we need to figure out ways of dealing with it and mechanisms to get through the day and what have you. And I think that that's the, that's the important thing. And then, and then the other part of that is... Um, um, we say these things glibly and they become slogans on shirts and what have you. But I believe that I've lived this my whole life and that is to be the sheepdog, to stand on the wall, to stand on, on the bridge um, and what have you. And that we speak out and not only speak out, we stand up for um, against evil and for what's right and starting with our families and, you know, and that we do these things. Um I think that's that is that is why most of us stayed longer than two seconds when we actually got the opportunity to be in come in service. Right. Am I am I yeah am I speaking? I yeah. mean, is this yeah. No, I, I agree. I, I think that so many of the people that are in the military, especially in combat arms, are are there for that reason. But 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 my point is that as as veterans afterwards is to keep that mindset that yeah. That's what we do. Yeah. That is who we are. Yeah. And um, I believe that's important. That's vital. Yeah. Anyway, that's me. John, where, uh, if people want to follow you or get in touch with you, is there any anything that you want to plug or tell people where they should go and look for you? Okay. Well, um, I know you posted a link to my um, the book I just did on Amazon. Um, I wrote a book called um, Advice to Partisans. And without wanting to, I'm not trying to punt the book. I just want to say, I've had some one-star reviews because people don't understand. I was literally trying to say to people in the book, man, think about things like this. Uh -huh. so, but anyway, so you can find the link there um, on, on, on your on the description to that, and, and you can track me on that. And just Google me or, or search me on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. I post bits and pieces all the time. Uh um it's uh, I can I can share more if you like. Um, yeah, go go for, go for it. If there's I, anything you want you, to tell you can people plug about. anything you want. Like we're well, happy. To, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I don't have anything to plug. I mean, I wrote the book and I put it out there for people to buy if they want. It's literally just above cost price. Just to you know whatever. I'm um, advice to partisans. I'm 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 looking at what's happening in Ukraine and I'm I'm hearing what's happening in other places that people want to do stuff. And what I was trying to say to people, Ned, is um and I'm and I'm curious to hear what what, what people think about it, who actually maybe know something about this thing, is that don't forget, you need to make sure that you have medical supplies and knowledge. I'm not trying to say to people, this is how you treat medical issues. Right. But uh, I get a, a criticism on, on Amazon about Oh, this book is useless, he, you know, because he says that. And I'm like, no, dude, this is an 80 page book that is like, he has a framework. Think about these issues. You've got to deal with the fact that if you are going to be a partisan, someone in your group's going to die. You need to think about logistics. You need to think about communication. These are some of the things like use an abatist to stop tanks and you can do this. But when you do that, remember, and that's advice to partisans. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and so, so I wrote the book. Specifically, because I, I I got the feeling that there's too many people who don't understand what's going on. They don't they don't see and and I keep talking about this. I've been speaking about this for a long time about the difference between um, rural warfare and urban warfare and um, what's happening with uh, with Putin who um, who observed um, the second battle of Brosny where they just flattened it and they're all over the rubble because the first battle of Brosny. Um, the Russian army got absolutely destroyed and, you know, talking about, about, about these things and these are important things because they affect what's happening right now. Right. Um, um, and how people think and how people approach this. And, and, and the other part of that is that I think that people have forgotten what warfare is. We used to police actions, bigger, 
bigger or smaller, they police actions. Mm -hmm. They're not the grind. I mean, today is the 11th of the 11th. The armistice was signed at 5 a.m. in the morning. And in the armistice, they agreed that the guns would stop at 11 a.m. Between 5 a.m. and 11 a.m., approximately 10,000 men died. That's what war is. Right. No reason for those men to die. Right. They signed the armistice at 5 a.m. In the, in, in the morning. And they, it was just convenient to make the gun stop at 11. So 10,000 men died for convenience. Yeah. Can you imagine that in today's world? Impossible to imagine. Yeah. So people have forgotten what war is. They honestly have. And those of us who've experienced war hate war the most. We're also the people who miss war the most. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, and I can say that to you guys. And, you know. Yeah, no, no, I understand. Because you understand. You you get it. Um, um, there's lots of things that go unspoken about, about the experience that are very attractive to men. It makes, yeah. it make, it makes yeah, yeah. a way... So much nonsense and focuses on on things that are really important and are orientated the way our minds work and how we work as you know with other men and in teams and there's all these positives to how how we work and the civilian life is just too much complexity for a lot of us. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah. Yeah. So um and it's you know you know if you've got a problem shoot it. <laughs> yeah. Or if you exactly. yeah. blow it up. It's the same thing. It's pure. It's, yeah. If, if blow it up, that's a shoulder that you haven't used enough explosive. You exactly. Know, it's simple. Well, yeah. <laughs> so uh, um, we yeah. have we have two uh, two questions yeah. real quick, or actually two. Uh, Hassan uh, eleven sixty six. Thank you very much. Hey John Umberto S from the old Army Talk days. Glad yes. to see you on here uh, on the team house. You finally made the big time. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, thank you, man. I, I've got to tell that story. So um, just soon after ninety four, what I've been talking about about talking is nobody was talking. Okay, we right. just nobody communicated about stuff. And so what I did is I created a, um, a listserv called Army Talk. And uh, we started an email conversation and it built up to about between 200 and 300 like regular like, subscribers. And at the peak of it, we were exchanging like six, 700 messages a day, emails a day. Wow. And so it was like really busy. And what was interesting about it was that there were people on there that I've become lifelong friends with. Look at this. Hello, Humberto. <laughs> um, there are people on there like um, Barry Fowler, who became a really good friend of mine, um, um, who's a, who was an army psychologist. And he actually, him and I have had long conversations about so all these kind of topics. We'd have these really interesting topics. And I mean, uh, Trevor Perks and um, <laughs> all these, all kinds of interesting people. Even Donald R. Morris, who wrote The Washing of the Spears. He was a subscriber for a while. Um, and, um, David Hackworth, who wrote about face, as you'll know, when he started Soldiers for the Truth, he actually co I corresponded with him for a while because we were talking about, you know, the kind of thing that, that that he was doing and literally because of the Army Talk thing that he thought there was a, a correspondence um, in, in, in what we were going to do. And then that didn't happen. I mean, he died and all, that, all the rest of it. So, I mean, Army Talk was very important for a while. And then things like Facebook and came along and all these online boards and it kind of petered out, but the, the list is still there. I still, still on Google groups. <laughs> we, awesome. we still chat. We still chat. So thank you very much. And the second question uh, was uh, from KJM. Thank you very much. How much of an outlier is your 35 year Sandaf service? Seems to me that you cross a unique geopolitical and generational part of the 100 plus year history. Well, Okay, outlier, I don't know. So so what happened, I think, is that um, a lot of guys served because they were compelled to serve. Uh -huh. So when they pulled up, they they went and, and they did their, their, their service, their camps. As we approached, after about 91, the, 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 the call-up ratio, the, 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 the response, the reporting ratio decreased heavily. Um, there were a lot less people who were willing to actually do it. Um, I think as much as like 70% non-reporting or something, it was wow. like really, really hectic. So yes, that was a small, a small grouping right there. And then after 94, there was even more reluctance because there was no compulsion. Um, people had still had political issues. They had, you know, those kind of sort of issues. And so there was a much smaller, um, retention ratio of people actually continue to serve um, over that. Um, I would say that there's a couple of hundred of us. 
a couple of hundred of us, uh, maybe as much as that. Um, and we probably all know each other. We run each other so many times at exercises and deployments and schools and that kind of stuff. In fact, you probably find most of them in my friends list on Facebook. <laughs> John, thank you so much for this like wide ranging interview and like a super interesting perspective that, you know, over here, us Yanks, we don't necessarily get to hear this so often. So, I mean, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Uh, absolute pleasure. Uh, absolute pleasure. I, I was a bit concerned that, um, that, you know, it would be a little bit boring for people who don't know the background to a lot of this stuff, but um, I hope you came across all right. No, I think, he, I think he did a terrific job of explaining the background, and I hope people come away from it with, like, a greater understanding of, like, the complexities and, and what a difficult time in history this was and, and, I don't know, a greater understanding, right? That's the goal. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much for having me on, on the show. Much appreciated. Thank you, John. Yeah, we really any, appreciate anytime, it. Anytime, John, and please, please stay in touch. And we will be back with all of you guys out there next Monday. We're going to have Greg Coker here in studio. Um, so we will see you in uh, just two days. Um, John, again, thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll see everyone out there in a couple days. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much.